Welcome. Welcome one more day to the land of Regenera. Oh, I'm so excited. Today, I'm going to take you with me. Oh, let me introduce myself. Um, today, I will be your tour guide. We're going to visit one of the worlds and I'm going to tell you a story. So, in order to do that, mm, first we need to find the right direction to go. Let me see. Okay. Okay. This is so mathematical, you know? You really need to... Aha! Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, I got it. I got it. I'm going to show you. Okay. Oops. Sped up. One second, in order to show you. Hmm. In order to show you, I need to. Okay, okay, okay. We're about to travel to the land of. The art district. Let's go. Hmm. <laughs> Welcome, welcome to the art district. Mm. Uh, have you been around lately? Many changes have been happening in this land, which is amazing. Today, I want to take you to an amazing place. The Lake of Atlac. Have you been here already? Mm. Many things happened in this lake a long time ago. Let me sit here with this dead body. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, but I'm gonna leave this because my computer might crash. So uh, we're all in that lake, okay? Like we, this is an exercise of visualization, or you can also go to Topia and go with me is topia.io slash art guion like rayita district easy um okay long long time ago that lake that you just saw the lake at lack was completely flat there was not a single wave going on in that lake and the gods love to just Speak from above the clouds to just contemplate their own reflection because the lake was like a mirror. So one day the wind of the north arrived to the lake and oh, the wind of the north loves movement. So it brought the waves and the illusion of the mirror got completely broken. The gods were so pissed off, they decided to leave. So suddenly, the lake didn't have the protection of the gods anymore. <laughs> nice. Go down, go down. Go with me. Thank you, Nico, for your support. So, um, without the protection of the gods, there was a space for the wind of the east to arrive to the lake. And the wind didn't come alone, he brought clouds, many, many, many clouds. Soon enough, this whole lake was covered with clouds and, of course, it started raining. And it rained for hours and then for days and then for weeks, and the paths got completely underwater and also the rocks and also the small city there was this tiny town of ancient people here in the lake it got completely underwater hmm. after that there was only silence in the lake so the lake remained completely silent for, for a long time until the wind of the west arrived 
and he didn't vibe really with the with the silent situa situation. So he decided to create a current of air from Natura, the village, Regeneradec, and Agora to bring the most amazing birds from all around. So soon enough, the birds started to arrive to the lake and they started to sing. And with their song, the silence started to back up, you know? And if you go now to the lake and you stay there for a little bit, you will be able to hear the song of the birds of Atlak that keep singing every day for the silence to not to come back. And this is connected with the theme of today. Today we're going to talk about restoration and capital transfer. So the winds fucked it up a little bit and then the situation started to improve, right? Just restoring the space and that's when that's the way we're headed to. If the next generations of wealthy people start investing more in restoring the land, uh, everything is going to be so much better. So yeah, this is the introduction for the session of today. Thank you so much. And go visit the world. I promise it's fun. Thank you for your attention. I'll see you around. Thank you, Kara. That was lovely. Oh, I like your I like your portal. I have one too. I don't have it with me, but <clears throat> I have a portal too. Portals are amazing. I know you like my portal. <laughs> nice. Is it is it made out, is it made out of crystals of Regenera? Yeah, yeah, of course it is. I collected them myself. Oh <clears throat> I I've seen some of them in like if you visit I don't know where they were. Were they in the art district? or in natura i think in natura natura you can go pick up some crystals so but there's a place with crystals see but do not explode the land don't take them all por favor if you take something you leave something no can we grow crystals of course we can like there was like i remember when we were kids there was this like um, science sets that you pour water and it grew crystals you need to talk with the alchemist of of natura mm -hmm. Yeah. Where, where, is, where can I find him? You will have to go explore. Mm. See. Is there okay. a password? Of course, there's a password. But that also you need to figure it out. I'm sorry. <laughs> you have information right away. <laughs> Too many things to figure out. This is so <laughs> complicated. <laughs> well, you're in Regenera, you know. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, nice. thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Um, with that, um, I wanted to ask, um, can I show, um, can I see a show of hands? Uh, who of you are already citizens of Regenera? Huh? Some, some, I see. Uh, but that means that there are still people who are not. And you're all invited to be citizens of Regener. So let me post the link there for you so you can become a citizen. There you go. It's a simple form and there's a few things you need to do. You just need to tell us your Regener name. You just need to tell us five words that represent you. You need to, if you want, make your citizen card and I'll show you what that is. And then just Tell us what your pledge is. What are you pledging to do? And I'm going to share with you um, some of the pledges because they're really beautiful and they're very worth reading. So give me just one second while I put these up and I show you. Give me one sec. Okay. Let's see. Let me share my screen. Perfect. So let me go into a view here. OK, 
Okay, cool. So let's see who do we want to, let's see, Bunny White. See, that these are the, the citizen cards um, in the form that I posted. You can create your own. If you don't know how to do it, there's instructions there. Or there's a little video. If you don't know how to do it, just submit your picture and I'll do that for you. Don't worry. Um, so um, Bunny White is a futurist and her pledge is I'm committed to stewardship of the land we're building our homesteads on, to cultivating a regenerative community in my town, my region, and to bringing forth my artistic healing talents for personal and collective benefit. Oh, thank you, Bunny White. Thank you for your service. Um, let's see. Mm, let's see, Selena. I pledge alliance to the planet the land, the water, the air, and to all species that inhabit this homestead would share. One earth, one love. Oh, that's a nice one. Let's do one more. One more, one more. Oh, Claire, I love her, Claire. Did you see her yesterday? She's just so good. So good. Clarity, I love, I love that right there, name. Um, her pledge is to invite coherence into the dynamically emerging field of our evolutionary citizens. Isn't that lovely? So yeah, so just tap in, send your form, become a citizen, make your card, choose your archetype, and join us in the fun. Roxana, are you there? Do you want to come on stage with me? I am the spirit of the vision train. Just kidding. I'm not the spirit of the vision train. I am Roxy and I am here. Human Poxy. Poxy. I'm Poxy. My name is Poxy from Regenera. And I am here to share with you a message. A message from the revolutionary creators of the Design Science Studio. We actually have four people who have put together the most magnificent piece of art to welcome us into this day. We will experience it. And this was created by a collaboration of Benjamin Mai, Turquoise Sound, Sherry Sophia Herndon, and Future Primitive. And to welcome us, they say, we, the people of Earth, are we reawakening to an ancient truth. We each have medicine to heal our planet, and we have a unique note to contribute to the symphony of life, the song of Earth. Scientifically and spiritually, we are all connected to pulsing, humming, web of life. All life, including all of humanity, belongs to this global resonant field. When we express our essence and harmonize with others, we can collaborate, coordinate, and co-create a world that works for 100% of life. This way of seeing and being is the realization key of SDG 17, achieving global cooperation. This experiential artwork weaves together multiple artistic contributions in the shared intention to unite humanity to facilitate a shift in global consciousness. This co-creative process between Sherry Herndon, Future Primitive, Benjamin Life, and Turquoise Sound was created as a channeling meditation to transcend, intended to harmonize humanity within a web of life to offer a unifying worldview for global coordination to support individuals on their journey of self-realization in service to the whole. With writing and narration from Sherry, music from the artists and ally Rain, Future Primitive, and visuals and editing from Benjamin, this conceptual inspiration from Turquoise, this co-creative process of shared intention and group flow was a manifestation of the harmonization that meditation invokes. This piece is called Song of the earth. And it is a part of a NFT drop that is happening as of tomorrow. What's interesting is that this is the first one that we have participated in. And it is with a platform called Doing Good. 
This platform uses Polygon, which is an Ethereum compatible blockchain that is proof staked by nature. It's not dependent on energy intensive hardware to run, which is the main reason that they use it um, because proof of work has higher carbon footprints. And so additionally, they've partnered with uh, various social impact organizations to promote a variety of social impact causes, including positive climate impact. So they have called us in as one of the partners to support uh, creating work that can uh, help to perpetuate increasingly sustainable and environmentally conscious ecosystem and to help creators create consciously in this new creator economy. So despite the fact that this is a new space, an emerging space, we are doing our best to participate in an ethical way. And today I will share with you this piece, Song of the Earth, which is one of the pieces of work that will be debuted in this exhibition tomorrow. I invite you to come into presence and give yourself the gift of this time. Welcome. Tuning our bodies, our instruments, to the humming vibrations of life, to the rhythms and pulse of creation. First, tune in to your own inner presence the inner vibrations that make up your unique expression, your unique gift, you as original medicine for a healing earth. Breathe into the still point within your body. You are an antenna receiving and beaming. Even as you hear sounds around you, seemingly from the outside, allow this field of intelligence to reverberate within you as you become even more aware of the unique note that you are. We are in the creation field, the sourcing field, the womb of life. We are tuning our instrument to the heartbeat of life, the earth's song, humanity's song, and your voice, your exquisite presence, and essence has never been here before. And we need your note to join the celebration for collective thriving. Notice how every moment is an opportunity to tune our instrument, to drop into deeper trust of ourselves a deeper love and appreciation of who we are and who we are becoming. This becomes an act of creation. Remember, know thyself. You are an ancient and future human and know that you belong to this intimacy of life. The one and the many. Feel your own delightful vibrations emanating from within. As you gather in this gravity of awareness, you begin to open yourself more fully to feel the wholeness, the seamlessness of life, and this allurement of yearning to co-create with others 
in harmony. Struggle no longer belongs to this symphony of sounds. This emerging organic ecstasy being fully present to life as a love story and to your perfect belonging in the harmony of the cosmos. Now feel the presence of others and their essences and their unique notes. Together we are needed. Together we awaken in beauty and truth and goodness. We are unstoppable as the heartbeat of humanity. Allow this realization to penetrate every cell in your body. Your body at the core of this fractal, connected to everyone who is here with us. This is the essence of a global coordination system where we are co-ordaining each other into our highest expression. Being able to play like a jazz ensemble, like an improv band for solutions and innovations and wise decision-making all on behalf of the whole. Feel how we can synergize effortlessly when we welcome others in their uniqueness and we let them shine and we join together in this beautiful song. always grounded in our note, our capacities from this place to listen, to welcome the newness and the new harmonies. This is innate and is our birthright. Our bodies like vibrating antenna for our most amazing expression as we co-create together a world that works for all. Repeat after me. I am fully present. I am listening to the wholeness around me. I belong in this song of life. We belong to this song of life. Now that we have 
synchronized to the heartbeat as Gaia. I am ever so pleased and deeply inspired to introduce our first brilliant live contributor, creator, designer, artist, producer, amazing, amazing human here with us today. Aliko. Hi, Aliko. How are you? Good morning, everyone. Good day, good day. Well, everyone, just so you know, Aliko and I have been meeting the past few weeks and weaving and scheming about how we can partner and support and amplify more creators for this shared mission. And born and raised in Seattle, Washington to a French Jewish mother and Caribbean father, Aliko is the first generation American trans black presenting Jewish entrepreneur and producer, the founder and director of U Productions and Expansion Festival. In his branding website, photography, videography, and event production business, he is able to live his dedication to carving out spaces for humanity through this work. And today is our keynote speaker presenting Returning to Our Houses of Magic, Art and Design for Restoring the Collective Soma, which is so perfect as today is all about restoration and capital transfer. As a partner and a friend, uh, and, and someone who's also woven in so many other incredible voices to support this mission and the summit. Aliko, welcome to Regenerate Rising and thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Yeah, yay. So what a powerful place to be on a Tuesday morning. Um, just from the present staff. Roxy, will you let me know uh, when I have three minutes left? Yes. Thank you. Awesome. What a powerful place to be on a Tuesday morning. Uh, my name is Liko. Roxy, thank you for presencing me uh, into the space. Uh, again, um, you know, first generation American Jew, born to a Caribbean father and a French mother. I'm here in Seattle on Duwamish land. Um, and again, uh, yeah, I. I'm the founder and director of U Productions. We do events and we do um, business development, all for the purpose of carving out spaces for our humanity. And today, I'm so glad I'm going after that uh, amazing video um, because it is exactly the foundation of what I'm going to be talking about a little bit later at 1.30. And right now I'm gonna give you like a 15, minute kind of download about what I'll be talking about later. <clears throat> so my talk is called Returning to Our Houses of Magic, uh, Art and Design for Restoring the Collective Soma. And by Soma, I mean body. And what I mean when I reference the uh, house of magic is our bodies. Um, my talk later on is going to go through the history of capitalism and specifically something called primitive accumulation. Primitive accumulations is a Marxist term that specifically refers to the um, uh, privatization of land, but it also includes four things that is necessary for capitalism to take a stronghold on society. And those four things are the control of women and bodies, land expropriation, so privatizing of land, uh, the colonization of Americas and the construction of differences. And um, I will be taking everybody through a deep history of capitalism starting in feudalism prior to capitalism where um, people live together closer to the land, where um, gender roles were, there was much more solidarity between genders, um, where people were not paying rent at the time, but tallage and the resistance to uh, paying tallage to the lords of the land, the landlords. Oh no. Okay, maybe we have a painting interlude while Aliko restarts. Look at this beautiful bird. Wow. This is pretty. Hopefully Aliko will be here in a minute. Internet seems to have gone over. It's just 
enjoy this heart center work for a moment. It is deep. Okay, while Aliko comes back, we'll have a spontaneous poetry pause. <laughs> hey, everyone. Hi to sprinkle a poetry pause while we wait. So this poem, I guess it was meant to come to all of us today. And it is in relation to uh, what uh, we've been talking about. It's called, Do You Ever Wonder What Animals Wonder? Do dogs mourn in misery? It is a human's life. Do bugs ouch and ike in irritation? Oh, don't human me today. Do pigs pontificate their obstinance? Oh, don't be so human headed. Do held horses hoof patient cravings? Oh, hold on your humans now, please. Do monkey businesses have a mission? Oh, stop this human business of planetary greed and hurt. Do elephants in the room wonder, bewildered? Oh, can humans wipe species slurs of superiority in a relative scheme of life? Do you ever wonder what animals wonder? while we are wondering our technology friends thank you for wondering together <laughs> here is aleko welcome 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 back can you hear us dear okay i'm back that was crazy just getting kicked off my internet, uh, which never happens. But thank you for your patience. And I'm sorry I missed that poetry. Can oh, you hear me? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. There's a painting happening alongside you, which is great. Yeah, I guess I'll keep going. Yeah. Keep going. Is that, yeah. Is that yeah. what's alive? Okay. For sure. Awesome. Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, where was I? Uh, I was in the history of capitalism, and I'll be talking about that because I find that really the foundation of what we want to build for the future cannot be done unless we understand the carnage of the past. And essentially what's happening now in our society is really we are focusing a lot on the black and brown pain body, which is very important because black and brown and people of the global majority folks have gotten the short end of the stick of capitalism and white supremacy. And what I'll be going into, I've been really fascinated with, I'm half white as well, and like the white pain body and what happened in middle age Europe to separate the mind from the body, separate people from nature, and I think that essentially the knowledge of well and good ancestors prior to late, prior to the rise of capitalism is becoming more um, aware, uh, like widespread the, the knowledge of, oh, there's magic in all of our lineages. And so returning to our houses of magic really means returning to the body um, because capitalism is, has controlled the mind and the body. Um, and I'll be talking about like the very subtle and very curated ways um, that ha that happened. For example, um, during the reign of Henry VIII, um, around the 1500s, um, 72,000 people were killed 
uh, and mostly vagabonds and travelers for and for functioning outside of the realms of capitalism. I believe there's like 161 laws at one point where you could be killed. And most of it was for functioning outside for, 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 for not participating in the new machine. And so how our bodies were really forced into uh, this systemic carnage that we are living out daily. And I'm using that as a platform to go a couple different ways. We could go social justice. Today, I'm gonna be going um, art and design. Um, I had the pleasure of, I have the pleasure of knowing and have had the pleasure of hosting Morgan Beershank, who's the um, founder of Geoship. And I'm love that this is, uh, this event is supported by Buckminster Fuller because Buckminster Fuller was the first pers uh, first group to popul popularize the geodesic dome. Um, and I'll be going into the science behind uh, how art and design can reintegrate our bodies and reintegrate our spaces and reintegrate consciousness into society um, through, through geometry. And I also love that poetry, geometric, you know, resonance thing because it was all about coming back to the body. And I'll, through, and, and the geometry was playing in the background and how our bodies have an innate wisdom to resonate with certain geometries. Um, and then I'll be talking about practical ways to implement these changes um, in, our, in our lives um, and through embodiment. Uh, coming back to this house and magic and spaces, creating houses of magic around us, and also our businesses and projects. As a business owner for the last five years, uh, I consider myself an anti-capitalist uh, business owner. And essentially what that, how I do that, it's different for everyone. I think capitalism has made us all a very monoculture, so th very much the same everywhere. So to, to you, so coming through and out of capitalism essentially is finding what's unique to you. Um, what is unique to you and how do you redefine success? How do you redefine success, success in your projects, in your daily life, in your body, in your uh, families, in your friend groups? Um, and I really have been thinking a lot about this system that we are coming from and living through and recognizing that every act of love towards yourself or another is reparations. So all these new technologies, all these new, like I meant, when I say technologies, I mean ways of being in terms of our communication, like consent work, uh, conflict resolution, um, dance, embodiment work, um, just these new, everything being talked about uh, this week in this conference, like these new ways of being, you being here this morning on a Tuesday, all of this is reparations from an oppressive system. Um, so yeah, I want to leave you with that. So continue to love yourself and be in your body if you don't come to my talk. Um, and yeah, thank you. Continue to repair with yourself and each other. Um, and thank you from Jeet. Yeah. Um, with each other. And I hope to see you at my talk at 1.30. Um, and yeah, if you'd like to know inf more information, you can find me. Thanks, y'all. Sorry about the weird tech, you know, setup. Oh, I hope to be doing this in person with you, Roxy. I'm planning to write Roxy a proposal for like 2024 to do something like this in person. Yes, um, in person. We love in person. Yes. <laughs> this, oh, I'm so excited. Yeah. We're ready for in person for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I produce lots of in person magic with a lot of amazing people, just like you. Oh, yeah, thank you, Eliko. That was really Cheers. beautiful. We're, we're sad to lose you for a minute, but you came back to us. So yeah. it was beautiful. Um, 
yeah, I can't wait to hear more about the work that you're doing with GeoShip and just the work that you're doing on the ground. It's really needed. It's it's a very, very um, fundamental part of our history and our future <laughs> that we're, we're moving into. So really appreciate it. From the Buckminster Fuller Institute and from the Design Science Studio as well. So thank you. And next I'm gonna call up Zach Stein, who is the co-founder of Carbon Collective, which is a company providing low fee diversif diversified investment portfolios built for solving climate change in 2020, um, which helps to eliminate the barriers to true climate impact investing. Zach, are you here with us? Good. <laughs> yes, I'm here. <laughs> awesome, I have a little bit more. Um, Zach leads the fundraising, hiring and portfolio research as well as um, being the author, the author of the ultimate guide to sustainable investing. I'm really excited to hear more about Carbon Collective and your work. So feel free to take it away. And I know you have another session later on. So really excited to, to hear more about what you guys are doing. And um, yeah. Great. Uh, maybe our, our toes in. <laughs> Perfect. I'll try and keep it fairly brief. Um, yeah, I trying to kind of integrate with the past speaker to some to some extent. Um, we capitalism, extractive capitalism got us into the mess that is climate change. Um, and if we are not able to change the trajectory that we're on, we are on a pathway to a um, pretty um, incredibly disrupted world, I think is a, 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 a polite way of putting it. And to get out of this mess, we have two options. We can go back to a pre-industrial time where we are not using um, uh, fossil fuels in, in that technology, so we're not emitting them, um, or we can go forward into where we have some of the comforts that we've come to appreciate today, such as air conditioning and traveling in cars um, and, and fast transport, the ability to talk uh, and, and for me to remotely attend these things, uh, but in doing so with 100% clean energy um, and without needing to burn things to do that. And for that, have to for that to happen, we need significant investment. Um, climate change is a problem. The beauty of it is that it is solvable. It is a huge, massive problem, but one that we can solve. We can reach a world in which we are no longer needing to burn things to power our, civil, our global civilization. And then we can start working on addressing the historic carbon emissions that are in our atmosphere, drawing us back down to pre-industrial levels. The only way that we get there is going to be through investment. And so what we do at Carbon Collective is we align investment strategies for people like you and me, whether you have an individual retirement account um, or you work at a company and want your 401k aligned with solving that, is we align your investment priorities or your investments with that goal. Um, so we divest from the uh, industries who are technologically incapable of existing in a decarbonized world, barring some miracle breakthrough. Um, it's about 20% of the stock market. We give their share to the companies that are building solutions to climate change. This is much more broad than just things like solar and wind, but building automation, insulation, electric cars, plant-based foods, et cetera. And then we broadly hold the rest of the stock market um, because these are the companies who can exist in a world where we have solved climate change. And so it's upon us as shareholders to vote to pressure them to get there as quickly as possible. Part of what we are what we are doing is wading into the fact that we live in a deeply imperfect world. Um, and for the, and, and by zeroing in on a question like climate change, which again, we can do a lot, um, uh, we can solve um, and do this. Uh, we're trying to find how do we work our way out of this and into something that is fundamentally more sustainable, uh, most importantly, environmentally, but more broadly as well um, as a human system. So um, you can come join us later um, uh, to hear exactly about uh, uh, if you've been wrestling with this question of how to treat your personal investments and look at it from this lens of climate change. We've thought about this a lot. Um, we've heard basically every question out there and, and um, are trying to build um, that world where we are, are on a path to solving it. So I thank you all so much for the opportunity of being here and I look forward to uh, seeing some of you later. Thank you, Zach. Um, Zach, you have like a lot more time allocated to you. You are absolutely welcome to keep sharing if you'd like. 
Okay. Uh, would people like to hear a little bit more about what we do and some of the problems? I would love to hear more. Thumbs up. Yeah, you have a solid 20 minutes right now. You can go for it. Okay. Okay. Um, so part of the reason we started Carbon Collective is that we believe sustainable investing is fundamentally broken. Um, again, for us to solve climate change, we know what ne we need to do. The um, the uh, uh, it's pretty clear. Um, awesome faith. Yes, climate change is a solvable problem. Um, we need to first dramatically increase the investments that we're putting into climate solutions. We have a lot of what we need to do today, and a lot of it isn't charity. Things like solar, wind, batteries, electric cars. Um, these are the things that we have uh, that are already largely profitable um, to deploy. It's just a matter of if we're doing it fast enough. Um, so for us to be on a path to solving climate change, the best estimates out there have us being uh, uh, needing to invest more like uh, about five to nine trillion dollars more per year into climate solutions. Um, uh, that's a lot of money. Um, it's growing, but it is a lot of money. Um, the uh, second thing that needs to happen is we need to wind down investments in fossil fuels. Um, if we are able to do that over the next 30 years, not only will we be on a path to avoiding catastrophic climate change, uh, but the world, there's more of a pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. Um, the world that we build is just a much better world than the one that we have today. The world that we have today, we have to burn a lot of stuff in order to power it. Um, and that leads to a ton of problems. Um, air quality is significantly worse. Um, our world today, it is, it is less healthy. Um, it is less just a lot of that pollution is uh, uh, in communities uh, of people who have been uh, uh, historically um, uh, uh, have been uh, have been uh, harmed by our global economic system. Um, and so that would go away. We would no longer be refining oil on the Gulf Coast of Louisiana. Places like Cancer Alley would no longer exist. Um, if you could remember all at the beginning of the, the pandemic, all of those skylines that you saw of, you know, in places like in India where it's like, oh my God, we can see the Himalayas from here. That's what that world looks like. That's a really important image to hold on to because we are again running the same world uh, that we have today. We're be able to transport ourselves. We're able to do things like this, but we just aren't doing so uh, burning things anymore. Um, which is a, a, which is really important and amazing that we can be on that path to doing that. Um, I, the only way that we get there is through investment. And unfortunately, what Wall Street and other kind of major providers of investment strategies have today, what they label as sustainable or what they label as ethical is not aligned with what science is telling us we need to do to solve what to us is our greatest sustainable issue, which is climate change. Um, they use a metric called ESG, um, which is a way to manage ethical risk. It was never built to be a values-based um, investment tool or an impact-based investment tool. It is just a less bad version of the world today. Um, what we are trying to do at Carbon Collective is say, okay, we know what we have to do to solve our most pressing issue, which is climate change. How do we work backwards and connect the dots to what is an intelligent portfolio um, to build today for something like your entire um, uh, uh, your entire IRA with it. So let me explain how we build our portfolios um, and our theory there. Um, the first step we do is we look at the whole U.S. stock market. Um, the and I'm seeing some good questions here, so I think I'll I'll get to those uh, in one sec. David, I like this one. Um, uh, so uh, what we do is we look at the whole U.S. stock market. About 20% of it are companies and industries that are technologically dependent on the long-term use of fossil fuels for their core business. Put another way, if we skip ahead to that world where we solve climate change, where we are no longer needing to burn things to power our civilization, those industries, barring a miracle breakthrough in technology, 
can exist. Those companies that are in it have either um, changed industries or gone out of business. This is obviously things like oil and gas, things like coal, also airlines, airline manufacturers, dirty utilities, petrochemicals, cement and steel and more. So we divest from these companies. Uh, there is often a lot of debate and uh, of should you hold as an environmentalist, should you hold oil companies in order to pressure them um, or because you need that seat at the table or should you divest? We very much are on the opinion of divesting. We think that engaging with fossil fuel companies in particular um, is in some ways even playing into their hands. So uh, we can touch more on that later, maybe in some of the Q&A. So uh, that's the first step is we divest from that 20%. We then give its share. So this is about 20% of our portfolios to the companies that are building solutions to climate change. Um, we, uh, uh, these is more than just solar and wind. What we do is we look at what are the best independent resources and plans for how we solve climate change. Um, we use groups like Project Drawdown, um, which if you're familiar with, or the International Energy Agency and say, okay, what are the climate solutions that they've identified? We then map those onto what are the companies that we can invest in who are building those solutions. And then we remove those who generate more revenue from the uh, fossil fuel industry. Because to us, climate pledges or talk is good, but it's cheap in this space. And how a company generated its revenue last year is the best indicator of how it's going to generate it in the years to come. So we give those that share to the companies that are building climate solutions. And then that's the second step. The third step is then engage. We broadly hold the remainder of the stock market. And this is in our core portfolios. Um, uh, and I see some great, great questions coming in, and I'm going to dive into those in a sec. Um, so uh, we broadly hold the remainder of the stock market because with some exceptions, these are the companies whose core businesses can exist in a world where we've decarbonized and solved climate change. It by no means means that they're environmentally friendly today. In fact, most of them aren't. Um, the example I often like to use is Coca-Cola. Uh, Coca-Cola is not an environmentally friendly company. But if we skip ahead to that world where we are no longer burning fossil fuels to power our society, there's no reason that Coca-Cola could not sell me a Coke in that world. They are just doing it with 100% renewable energy and 100% electrified fleet, and they are protecting instead of abusing their natural resources. That means to us, um, it is critical that we use our shares and our votes to pressure these companies to make those transitions as quickly as possible. Now for some, that is not, uh, people are like, I, I, I get that strategy. I really don't wanna be invested in Coke. So for that, we also have our climate only portfolios, which just invest in climate solution companies and green bonds. It's gonna have a higher level of risk and reward, but for some folks that's okay. The strategy I just described is our core strategy, which is meant to be a similar level of risk and reward as you would get for investing in a generic based uh, index portfolio. Overall, our goal at Carbon Collective is we want to make sustainable investing simple, clear, actionable, and accessible to all. So we have zero minimums um, on our platform. We charge the same as you would pay for a generic investment portfolio on a, a platform like Betterment or a Wealthfront. Um, and we are real people who care about this uh, as much as you do. Um, so if you ever have any questions, we are not robots uh, behind the scenes. You can always email us. All right. I want to dig into some of your questions. All right, I'm looking up. Okay, so David, you said, I realize you're coming at this from a financial perspective, but at what point will government stop attempting to continuing to drive economic models that are and have always been unsustainable and intentionally designed to be more bust bear than boom bull? This is such an interesting question when it comes to climate. And I think part of what you're getting at, and I think this is an interesting debate um, in this group, but it's one that I personally wrestle with, is degrowth. Um, is right now having an economy that is built on consistent growth is just fundamentally unsustainable. Uh, we do not have those level of natural resources. There are some crazy things like if we projected 2% annual growth for a million years, like there literally wouldn't be enough atoms in the universe to accommodate that. Um, so it's like, you know, compounding growth rates are crazy. Um, when it comes to climate change in particular, when we zoom in on this, the fact of the reality is we actually need massive growth in this. It needs to be a transition um, of capital. And so that is part 
of where we wrestle with is how do we plot the most likely course to solving climate change? And how do we do it in such a way where the end result is a much better world that we have today? It is more just. Um, and there's some ways that are just fundamentally baked into that um, of uh, so having electricity provided by solar and wind means that there's gonna be less pollution. There's gonna be fewer kids who are dying of asthma attacks. Um, that is just a fact. There's gonna be more justice there. It doesn't mean that, that there's going to be more economic justice necessarily. Um, and that is something that's a really important part of this transition that we really need to hold. Um, and we also have a ticking time clock. There is just a reality and a pragmatism that we we exist in a hyper capitalistic individualistic society. And part of the fear that I have is the more that we put in front of us needing to change how the global system works, the more the less likely it could be that we're able to make get to that transition in time. Um, and so that's where I actually generate a lot of hope um, is that even if we assume that our greed is going to be what continues to drive um, our, go our global capitalistic society over the next 30 years, that individual nations looking out for their best um, interests um, is going to be that, that those aspects of human nature, which human nature is wide and varied, we just have chosen or the system that has been built has just accentuated certain aspects of our human nature. But let's assume that that's not going to change. There are a lot of hopeful pieces um, within that. Uh, renewables, solar, wind, batteries, they are the cheapest form of generating electricity in most places in the world. That is likely only to become more so the case as we continue to pick the next lowest hanging fruit of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels is, an, is a resource that is getting fundamentally more expensive to extract. And it is actually a lead driver of inflation is the rising cost of those energy is part of the reason why things are getting more expensive. Renewables uh, in a lot of ways are actually the opposite. It's mainly a manufacturing problem. So the larger uh, uh, the scale that we have, the more that we can drive down those costs. So that's really exciting is that we don't need altruism to switch to 100% renewable uh, and zero carbon energy. There's a lot of things that help that transition go faster, but there's a lot of momentum behind that. Same for things like electric cars. Um, uh, these electric cars, they are just a better technology. They are safer, they are roomier, they can, they're faster, they can tow more, um, they have a, a, a tenth of the moving parts, so they cost way less to maintain. You can drive a Tesla for literally over a million miles. So you have like police forces around the country are buying Teslas because they pay for themselves within 18 months. And within the next five years, they're gonna cost less to drive up front. So it's a fundamentally just better technology that is here, that is rising, that we don't need to depend upon um, uh, greenies like me say, I'm doing this for ethical reasons. We get to say people being like, hmm, I like saving money. I'm going to choose an electric car um, over this, especially that infrastructure gets worked out. Okay. Alicia says, for my personal research, I realize that cancer and the farming belt are also strongly correlated. I wonder if you could speak to the agricultural contributions to the financial in imbalances contributing to climate change. Yeah, absolutely. This is, again, one of those spaces that's really hard and that industrialized agriculture is a space that has uh, is really unhealthy for our planet and the local landscapes and us, um, and has also arisen to be able to provide the level of calories that our system needs. There's so many ways for increased efficiencies um, within that. And there's a lot within regenerative agriculture um, that is growing and rising in how we're treating our land and how we're using it, um, where we're finding ways. And I think that we're seeing more alignment of that, of saying, oh, and this is, again, one of those areas where um, uh, uh, capital, where there, there's an element of hope, where uh, capital broadly is saying, oh, this is actually also aligned with our interests. Um, of having uh, more sustainable practices where the land isn't going to need to lie fallow after a certain period of time. Um, there's a lot of hope um, in that as well and a huge amount of work um, to be done um, with that. Okay, Zach, if there was one thing that you could change in our society that you think would yield the biggest amount of change at all levels, what would that be? 
one trim tab, one achievable change with the biggest amount of impact. What would this be? Um, hmm. I think to some degree, if at least this is again at a pretty narrow view, I would need to think about this to a great degree. Um, obviously, there, I think that there are aspects like if we could have uh, and understand uh, the uh, and, and do more to accentuate the parts of our human nature, if I could just uh, flip a switch and we all suddenly are much better able to understand the degree to which we are integrated with nature and not separate, separate from it, that would do a huge amount to solve our problems. Um, so I think if I could, if I could uh, snap my finger, something like that on a more practical uh, level or on a narrower level, at least from our lens, um, I think if we could change the narrative that sustainable investing and this and the transition um, to a, uh, a world where we solve climate change is fundamentally a sacrifice, but instead being like, no, there, this, there are rewards in this. And because we emotionally were so much more driven by a rewards than by the long-term aversion of pain. Um, that if we could uh, really have that, um, then that I think could be really, really powerful. Okay, solar does have about a four year buyback. Um, payback right now for manufacturing the panels, but it is still contributing in short-term carbon and other GHG emissions. Absolutely. Um, it is not like there is any perfect company or solution out there um, uh, with this. This is a part of why we need to hold our friends and hold those that are building climate solutions to also pressure them to make sure of how are we um, uh, making sure that they are leading um, and not just getting a free pass for being uh, things like solar companies um, as well. Um, yeah, biomimic thinking, uh, definitely. Um, so my idea and affiliation with others stand together and demand our global governments pull the plug um, until real solutions are integrated fully. Yes, this is where we, especially as um, both shareholders and individuals, we have great power uh, within this. We look at global brands they, I don't like to use this word, but I use this deliberately, they view us as consumers in this. They invest huge amounts of money protecting uh, our, their, our sentiment of them. That gives us power. They are the ones up on the stage performing. We're the ones who are in the audience getting to clap and give a standing ovation or uh, boo and, and leave the auditorium. And so there's a lot of power that we have. Um, we have uh, uh, the, if we look back kind of at the rate of how have humans organized themselves historically um, and, and kind of from the, the dawn of agricultural based civilization um, or kind of that we've had religion, we've had empire, we've had nation state and to a great degree now we have corporation. And so the more that we can change corporation, especially on the tight time frame that we have, the great impact we can have. Um, all right, seen a lot of messages come in. All right, question, what's your take? Oh, let's see. What's your take on blockchain DAO value creation with outcome uh, impact currency design? Um, so uh, blockchain is a really interesting um, uh, area here. To us, it still feels pretty early. Um, it often gets fairly conflated with like cryptocurrency. Um, in the currency space itself, it's pretty hard for us to see exactly where there are necessarily climate solutions within it. Maybe there's some less bad versions of Bitcoin, but less bad doesn't solve climate change. Um, in blockchain, I think that there are, there's likely creative ways. Um, all right, I've got three minutes to wrap. Uh, there are likely creative ways uh, to apply that for climate mitigation for having you know, more just opportunities for all of us to collectively own solar farms and track that ownership um, through the blockchain and things like that and profit from that. I think that there's a lot of room for creativity and more specific applications of blockchain. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's uh, it is an interesting area that we're, I think, just at the beginning of. Um, okay. 
I think just what I'll leave you all with is that um, our how we treat our money and what we do with it has power. And one of how, when it comes to climate change, what we like to think about is as individuals, there's so many things that we can feel like we're, we need to do. It can, be, can feel like a really overwhelming checklist of, oh, I have to do all this. Like, am I being pescatarian today? Am I biking to work? Um, how walking down the grocery aisle could be really overwhelming. Um, a lot of the ways of we like to say is, all right, how do you do the one-time changes first? These are often really big decisions. Where are you keeping, where are you banking? Where are you investing? How do you generate the electricity that you use in your home? How are you transporting yourself? These are pretty big decisions that take work to pick up and look at from all angles with it. But the nice thing is once you do that, once you switch your bank, or once you've switched to how you're sourcing your, your electricity, you just, you know, paint or read your book. You're no longer having to think, am I doing the right climate action? And then I can set and I can set you up to be like, all right, where do I really want to focus within this and participate in this movement? I'll, I'll, I'll end with this, which is uh, we often get um, a lot of the question. This came from just when we started Carbon Collective of folks saying, hey, I was born into a world that was run by fossil fuels. Why is it upon me to make change here? Um, you know, it was corporations and governments that got us into this mess and they should get us out. And to some degree, that's really true. And that anger makes a lot of sense. What I still have not heard yet is the counter, is, is the theory of change of how, how to actually change that system. The only way I've seen systems change in saying this is when enough people, you change the status quo, is when enough people stand up and decide that they want to change it um, and to go against it. And it is almost an act of faith to say, I am one person participating within this. But there are tipping points when enough people do something um, that leads us um, into change. And that's how the system changes. So with that, really thank you for having me. Um, we're here as a resource for any questions you have about sustainable investing. I think uh, we dropped a bunch of links here, so feel free to reach out. Yeah, I was just gonna say, this, these are great links. If you guys wanna capture them from the chat, it's, I, I just started the process myself. So <laughs> I'm really excited about transitioning. So yeah, this is all really, really uh, important. Sorry, I was unmuted. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you everyone. You were, um, you know, I was, I was remembering when you were saying that this last piece, um, there's, there's a video with a quote from Daniel Schmattenberger that really, really hit me. And I, I quote often, and he says, um, there's nothing really wrong with capitalism. It's just about, you know, what is wrong is the, the set of incentives that we have allow ourselves to have. And he says something like, you know, if, if a whale is worth a million dollars dead on a ship and is worth zero in the ocean, we're just like setting ourselves to the wrong incentives. And so the question then comes to what you were saying a minute ago is like, how do we change the narrative? Like, how do we just like, it's, it's not about the system, it's about what the system is pushing for, right? Um, which is interesting. I was also reading something this morning that, that was interesting. It's like somebody just questioning how, um, you know, we're automating the workforce and, and instead of just like taking that as an opportunity to just like have people work half the time, uh, what we're going to do is just like lay off of a lot of people, get some of people to work more. And it's like, it's just like trying to align the incentives with um, life and humans, right? Instead of just uh, capital. Yeah, uh, just, just, just to say, I really appreciate the, the ease of with uh, which you guys are making the divesting in fossil fuels accessible and easy. And, you know, like you said before, once you do divest and you start to invest in climate solutions, then you can sit back, not that you can sit back. We can never sit back really, <laughs> but it, you, it gives you ease of mind. And I just wanted to say thank you to Carbon Collective for actually creating that ease for, you know, the lay person for all of us. So I'm, I'm so glad that um, our goal is to uh, be of service and uh, help to provide a place where we can hopefully collectivize that impact um, that we're able to have together, um, where for you, you get to make that one-time action, which is a weighty one. 
um, but you know, these is this is your money. These are things that you've saved. Uh, but when you make it, uh, we can uh, do as much as we can uh, with it to collectivize that. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank, thank you. you. And also thank you for supporting this studio and the work we do. It's very very important and uh, amazing to 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 feel the support uh, from from people. So thanks for that. Cool. Um, how is everybody feeling this morning? Have you already become citizens of Regenera? I'm going to post the link again because it's fun. Uh, let me find it. Where is it? Here. Perfect. Um, also, um, as a reminder, before we move to our next segment, we are raising ourselves because we need some support to keep going and doing the things that we are doing, like this magnificent festival. So I'm gonna also put there the link to our crowdfunding campaign and uh, any help is appreciated. Like any dollar amount you send goes towards funding artists and, and creators and funding our operations so we can continue expanding uh, the gospel. Um, Ariette, hi. hi. Well, I'm so happy to have you here. Nice to be here, Nico. I'm so excited. <laughs> Such a great regenera. Yeah, so. it's been fun. It's been really like uh, yummy and fulfilling, I feel. Yeah, and I just love seeing things like Carbon Collective. It means so much to me. I love all the projects and, um, you know, my little contribution feels so small, but I guess together then it becomes this much bigger thing. Yeah. Remember, a dream tab is the smallest part of a system that has the greatest impact. <laughs> um, well, it is a pleasure to, to have you here. Uh, Mariette, for those of you who don't know her, uh, is a multidisciplinary artist based in photography and writing mostly. And, um, and her focus rests in creating intimate conversations that bridge a relationship between technology and the natural world, which is one of the things that has fascinated me the most over the past few years and and how we can how can we can use technology to amplify our our conversation with nature and and vice versa and so um super looking forward to to hear what you have to share with us okay great thank you yeah so uh i'll start up a screen share excuse me all of a sudden i'm uh i just got something in my eye, but <clears throat> I'll set up a screen share and we'll take a look at what is the basis for Mytopia world. And also for my, uh, for my New Art City uh, piece, which um, is been put together for me, uh, with me collectively. And again, that's just one of the amazing magical pieces of, um, of this program for me is that so many of the, the little collaborative pieces that I would dream of in my studio all of a sudden now I have a whole group of people who will pitch in and help. And that is magic as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> you know, so uh, I'll start the screen share into um, this, this little dream world that I have been building. And as we start, I'll tell you that, um, here we go, oops. Oh, wrong one, sorry, I do this a couple times. I was driving a lot before I got here today. So it's my afternoon and I uh, apparently had a problem there. Let me escape out of that. Anyway, so I'll keep talking. But um, what happened for um, me is that when I started this program, I said, I don't really have a project. Um, I am going to start that again. Um, I'm going to just help other people and I'm not worried about what it is that I can do. Uh, although I do have a little tiny project in the corner that uh, I may or may not, you know, bring forward. And through attending the sessions and through listening to all of the visionaries, I started to say, well, you know, I mean, it, it would be kind of a, a shame if I didn't put in a little effort here and actually um, invest some time in this seed I have. So I started to invest a little bit of time and here we go. Now we're, we're back where we wanna be in, in my world. And, um, and I grew something that I had thought was going to be called the infinite tree into something called dream tree. So now we'll do this again. And now we go into slideshow. All right, so now this should uh, hopefully show up. So what is the dream tree? Well, it's a little bit of an ecology. 
Uh, it's really about connecting individuals to movement is the, the best thing I can say that it is. And uh, it's, it's something, again, that I've been thinking about for a little while, uh, but I haven't really, up until recently, felt that I had the courage to do it. So it's, a, it's very much for me about um, putting us into this conversation, right? This conversation is critical. And as Charles Eisenstein has said, um, the reanimation of our world is crucial to ecological healing. If we live in the perception that the world is dead, we will inevitably kill what is alive. And that's probably one of our biggest problems is that in an urban planet, most people don't even know the world's really alive. And so that, that aspect of us having moved into being a primarily urban planet is, um, is something that is a challenge for us. But it's not an insurmountable challenge at all. So if we have these good intentions towards regeneration and we want to convert them into action, how do we do it? Now, lots of times we can have projects that are really specific. And those are amazing, and those do change the world. Um, but when I looked at my own contribution, I'm not an engineer, I don't really have a lot of practical skills. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, when you, when you do the self-interrogation, what can you do? Well, I can create space. I've created tents, I've created installations, I've created virtual worlds for years, um, just not in the digital realm, but always in the physical realm. And so the dream tree started to take shape when I realized that one solution to this, you know, problem that requires all of us is to create nurturing space and to create that space for an inner exploration that will connect to regenerative projects around the world. So that's what the dream tree started to, how it started to take shape. So um, instead of connecting people to problems, I do know that if you connect them to flow, and you give them space to discover, um, then they really get excited. They really get curious. And so I started to create for the program and specifically a dream tree that right in the center of it, I, I hid one of Bucky's uh, drawings from the 1970s. So what I started to do is to go in and collect some of his archival pieces of his drawings, et cetera, and to start to see ways that maybe I could um, eventually, you know, mask and unmask the geometry and the wonder of his work. In, in pieces. So I haven't fully realized all the animations and all of these other stuff, but I'm getting there. And I'm really excited to take you on the journey with me as I, as I am getting there. Um, primarily the dream trees have to feel hypnotic. They have to feel like a space or a place for meditation, conversation, where creativity is given its, its all. It's given a field. So that's what this is about. Okay, now, ultimately, uh, now you see that the little illustration has some, some great little domes <laughs> popping up in its field. Um, the dream trees are a framework for flow between mind and body and spirit, and they can be curated by groups, I imagine. Uh, they can be populated with raw materials for anyone to discover. And this pre preview and this prototype is what you'll see when we go into the Topia world afterwards. Uh, and I decided that if knowledge is one of the gluts that we have, one of the things we can't quite sort out, if that's one of the things that is really sometimes overwhelming, I'm not, again, the person who's going to build the search engine, maybe, but I can start to create relationships with wisdom. And our wisdom keeper here for this first one is going to be Bucky. Buck, our Buckminster Fuller to give him his proper name. Yay, you know, because he was from a different time. So, you know, sometimes I, I imagine he would like to be introduced by his proper name. Uh, so, um, so what did I start to do? I started combining text with icons, audio, and other nonlinear components to develop a narrative that you know, really could um, exist in different places. I took a pair of glasses, not quite his glasses, but they were the ones that were available to me at the time. And I started to think that, you know, if nothing else, Bucky's glasses and some of the imagery could start to develop almost a sense of um, oracle. 
So for me, this kind of becomes like the one of discs, if you were to have a tarot card or a pen, you know, the, the earth, you know, so I started to imagine what are the different suits? What would be the different way? And again, does it have to be exactly like a playing deck? No, it doesn't. It could be, you know, anything. Um, within Topia, there's a randomizer feature that works with card sets. And the people who created Topia and who created this feature are honestly um, amazing people. And so I, I know very little about them, but they're incredibly supportive too. And everything in their intake and all of that, again, reminds me that there is synergy and synchronicity here. And that is, again, one of the things about this program that has just been a joy. So. With, um, so within Topia, I was able to start to realize these really, really simple game mechanics. Okay, now what do some of the cards look like? Well, they're pretty simple right now, um, but they are developing. And these right here are direct quotes, um, as you can see, because I used the quotation marks, from Bucky, Bucky, and they are from Spaceship Earth. And so I started to think that because uh, of the way our attention spans work these days, because the different things that uh, can get lost in the translation over just a few decades, um, that maybe if I started to take large passages and turn them into separate cards, that there would be an interesting way to, again, feed on the information as it is and to create this kind of oracle feeling. So imagine if you walk in and you have a question and you just see, we are getting sharper. I mean, I could, I could walk around with that all day. You know, I could bring that into my meeting. I could use that as a way to say, yes, okay, when we go into this agile design session, we are getting sharper, let's feel good. And, and what else do we need to know? Well, we have wealth. If we're feeling scarcity, we always have wealth. Why? Because we have a sun and we have a moon. And something within that consistent feedback reciprocity loop is a model for us. So these are some of the ways the dream tree started to come into shape for me as I was building it and as I've been building it. And again, what is the, the core point here? It's that, well, physical energy and metaphysical know-how are the weave, right? So... Dream trees are online, um, can be online uh, in one iteration, they definitely are, to connect people as players to different thinkers and to different projects, to what I would call these online ecologies, right? So dream trees in real life uh, can also exist and they can be a system of tiny learning centers, connecting the online um, and also connecting urban and agricultural communities. So if I had my druthers, um, you know, somewhere in every one of everybody's eco communities and everybody's new buildings, um, we'd have a small curated section just for you to sit down and dream. And in there would be the playing cards and the different things from, from different places. So you didn't have to go into a classroom or maybe as you were on your way into a classroom, you'd have time to a nook just to sort of be. Um, again, if inside that nook, uh, we're connecting different projects, maybe we have artifacts that are, you know, also um, from the internet of things and they are, you know, alive in some way. Well, those artifacts could actually open up worlds for you. So again, I'm not here to do it all by myself, but I love being here and thinking about ways that I can connect all of us. Um, ultimately, one of the focus, uh, the, the foci um, that we have here is that dedicated to the improving the resilience in bioregional ecologies. That is one of the intentional bridges and one of the reasons why we use a tree, because trees exist in different places in space and time. And if we started to model um, more of the just sort of graphics involved in the local trees, or if we just knew, customized each dream tree to um, have a lot of ephemera from local as well as farther away projects, we can start to create the conditions of understanding um, group ecology and local ecology. So what creates um, action? Well, awareness, intimacy, consistency of exposure, and empowerment. 
And that's really what all of this is about. How do we convert intention to action? We're going to do it through taking all the great things and generating multi-logs, okay? Because again, dialogue is, is hard to do these days and dialogue doesn't quite cut it, right? But multi-logs, again, non-linear relationships can help us get to where we wanna go. So world building around trees is here because I wanna help create biophilia. I want us to remember that trees are wonderful, that ecologies are wonderful. And I do think that we have to insert that into our fantastical worlds um, online. And they help us remember the body and they help us remember that we are actually pathways and we are paths for self-discovery ourselves. And as we see ourselves as pathways for discovery, we can continue to discover more in others. Um, and that also can be facilitated through um, utilizing different types of NFTs and different type of capital models um, to get us there. Now, I'll get back to that in just a little bit. Of, uh, I wanted to talk about this in the context of our hybridity because uh, I'm going to run out of time here, so I don't want to I don't want to lose too much. I am I just chatty. And um, so here we are. So what I started to do is I took um, Bucky and I put him into an animated film. And I think I can run it without the sound, um, but maybe I'll, I can show it to you all uh, later too. I can actually run it without the sound. Um, and the sound actually will, again, we'll go into the world and we can see it. I'll put the link in the chat here. Um, it starts to create um, a relationship between Bucky talking about how he likes to talk to people's eyes in an off camera moment as he was getting ready um, to give an important lecture. Mm -hmm. And it kind of starts making this really a bit psychedelic, um, but it's not just a party trick. I mean, the forward visionary thinkers of today who are talking about all of the things that were taboo in the past are the same people who are incredibly serious about regenerating the earth. And so um, in here, if we follow it along, there's a narrative that starts to use these really simple, almost childlike graphics to connect together um, all of these ideas and you could play this in a party, you could play this in a quiet room. Um, the idea is that we wanna take everything that's really seems like an A-level difficult and make it really simple and sweet um, as much as possible. Okay, so I think I only have, let's see. Oh, I have two minutes left. Okay, so now we're gonna just move it along. Um, when my count, when, when my, when my, there we go, okay. So what are the other types of hybridity that I love? Well, we have hybrid nature. And so this is some of the art that I've been creating over the last several years, um, where I'll take things from images, like so those would be actually photographs that I've shot of, of existing places. And then I combine them with, let's say like a piece from art history. So that's the old Mycenaean bull, which would be like a evocation, right? Of like a really, really deep myth. Um, and we won't get into that, those myths right now or how those animals were celebrated for so long. Um, but these are the kinds of things that people wanted to start working with me. I'd love to animate these. I'd love to make them immersive. I mean, this would just be a joy. Um, why? Because we live in hybrid, highly recombinant landscapes. And that's not just a, a metaphor. I mean, this here right here is made through a series of um, photographs I took. Um, at the bottom is a little swan and there are these little bucky, um, uh, uh, what are they? Decahedrons? No, no. Oh, octahedrons, there we go. And uh, so they're the octahedrons, those are his sketches. And then there's a Canva owl that is actually in the Topia world and is a little sound piece when you get into the Topia world. And that was made by taking sounds of owls with a friend of mine and then him running it through a synthesizer and then boom, we have little tiny hybrid worlds. So the reason hybrid value is important is because we do have to start converting a lot of this into new economy. I did study at the first meta-currency cohort. Um, I am very excited to be involved with anything that has to do with creating um, more abundance, less scarcity. And when you look back at the way that money was structured years, many, many years ago, you know what went on money was artistic, symbolic, and deeply important. 
And so, um, so what we what we might turn into money now um, could be anything. Um, so obviously water and representations of water. Last thing I'll have a chance to get to because I'm hitting time is I did collaborate a bit during the project. I made a Dymaxian dream map for Julian uh, Ramirez and his projects and you can see it there. It's ready, you know, it's print quality. We could print it, we could turn it into a Dymaxian lamp. I mean, we can do things, <laughs> yeah, okay, great. You know, we can do these things and I, I'm really excited. Again, the DSS has been amazing because helped me turn things tangible. And that, that for me is a really wonderful experience. So maybe we'll get to continue this. Um, throughout the uh, Regenera, I'm going to host a couple of short brief conversations that pick up on a fireside chat that I gave before. And um, we'll just see where it all goes. I really wanna get people talking. I really love to talk about things in the margins if you haven't figured that out. And um, I'll even bring happy little cows. Um, and so, so, um, so we'll leave it there. And I'll just say that, yes, um, this does come from a bigger work I had written in 2016 published called The Digital Nomad Manifesto, which was basically an entire dive through um, consciousness and um, why I didn't think that it would any long work with borders and all these things that we seem so obsessed with now. And um, you're welcome to find that, but, um, I'll just go through these and say, stay in touch. Um, if the dream tree sparks your curiosity, reach out on social media. I'll put some stuff here in the chat. I'm at Ms. Papik on Instagram and Twitter for at least a little while. And thank you so much for barreling through that with me. Uh, thanks to the DSS for existing. Wow, Marriott, that was amazing. <laughs> Just, um, there are so many incredible ideas. I have a little block in front of our, our screen right here. Um, so many incredible ideas there that were popping up and your art is incredible. It's beautiful. Um, so just to let you guys all know that you can find Mariette at Topia today, um, as well as please, please put the links into the chat not only for everybody else, but also personally for me, because <laughs> I would love to explore more. I love the Demaxian map as well. That was um that was something that I haven't seen yet and really, really just beautiful work. And the the weaving of dreams into the space is really powerful. And I feel like um just to to take in a you know breathe in the the nature of the vision of the future that we want to see and Bucky held that for us in a way that was really possible. And I, I see that in your work. So just want to say thank you. Really beautiful. Um, so do do find Marriott today on Topia. Not only is it going to be fun, but you get to weave with her worlds and see more of, of your art and also of the science behind your work. And don't they, they get to interact with you as well, right? I'm going to go in there uh, and I, should I go now or I guess I could take people in or should we go in a little bit? Roxy, do you, do you have a... I think going now would be great. So if you wanna dig deeper with Mariette, now's a good time. Um, we can do more scheduled stuff, but I think right now as you're in the space of the spirit of the essence of it and now is a great time to go play. So if we'll just pop the link in the chat. Um, and then I... Oh. Yeah. Go ahead. I also wanted to add that um, both Zach and Breen from Carbon Collective are also still here and we would love for um, any lingering questions. Um, we've created a breakout room in this session, so please join the breakout room as well. Um, there were a lot of questions I still held for them. So yeah, if, if you have any other questions for them, you can find Marriott and Topia, you can find Breen and Zach in a breakout room so you can go to either place. Um, yeah, just really, really excited to to continue to weave with with both of you. I can't wait to see you in Topia. I'm really excited. Um, but stay on if you are come back. Stay on or come back. Um, we're here with um, with Gmo um, Sir Odio. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Gmo, um, who actually is a friend and came about um, through, I think you just found TrimTab Space Camp, right? Did you find it through just marketing from the Buckminster Fuller Institute or? 
Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I think some of the permaculture communities uh, had shared the program and we had like two days to, to get it all set up, but we're happy we did. Yeah, that was amazing because not only did you have one of the missions, but you also got to interact and weave with a lot of people. And then you also found the Design Science Studio. He's with us in Miami for the Regenaissance. And he sparked a lot of interest within the um, the um, blockchain space and has taught me personally a lot <laughs> about blockchain um, and continues to teach me about blockchain. Um, he's the founder of Just Learn and Sylvie. Um, he's also um, a native to Mozambique and lives in Miami, um, works on environmental education and circular agriculture and technologies. He's created many, many different incredible technologies, um, which I hope you get to share today. Um, yeah. uh, and then most recently he launched Sylvie, which is connected homes and schools to reforestation efforts using Web3 coordination tools. Excited to learn more. Awesome. Thank you, Faith. Um, yeah, so I mean, I'll be presenting um, again in three hours, uh, and that will be a much uh, more of a, a deep dive into some of the blockchain um, stuff we're doing with trees, with natural capital. Um, and uh, I encourage you to, to check that talk out. For now, I thought I would just um, go over our work a little bit more in, in, in terms of what circular design is, what it means to us, uh, how it should define education and lifestyle, at least moving forward. Um, our approach with environmental science specifically um, and how um, what we've learned from environmental science and particularly from, from closed loop systems, aquaponics being a great example uh, to, to, to build software that can help with coordination and tracking and data, um, ultimately scalable into trees. So, um, so yes, as Faith mentioned, uh, Jess Learn uh, and our team attended uh, Buckminster Fuller's uh, TrimTap Space, Space Camp program um, last year. And in that we developed a circular design, which, which I'd like to cover just a little bit more today. But before that, I'd like to anchor sort of what, what our mission is all about as an education company, as an ed tech. A company and our our mission is very much to help the world transition into a circular economy. Uh, we tend to use the word regenerative a lot, and that's great. Um, it's it's almost like a, a net positive uh, activity. Uh, but we're in the economic sense, at least, we're failing to operate uh, with true circular economics. Um, and and we all know the the challenges of of, of that uh, being pollution and waste streams and inefficiency. So um, there is a lot of hope, however, in, in transitioning the economy. For one, the carbon markets are, are soaring to life. Uh, there is exponential growth of, of ESG and natural capitals. Um, I will be focusing a little bit today, however, on, on the role of citizen science as a grassroots effort and the and the convergence of, of technologies that are unlocking just so much uh, for, for us as humans to, to do. So this is just a quick glimpse of what is possible today um, and not possible too long ago, but with things like mobile technologies and internet and even GPS uh, coordinates, we're able to participate as scientists uh, in basically all types of, of ecosystem restoration and ecological uh, data capture and even climate action. Um, and and it, it was this that drove us to think about a circular uh, design model that uh, started off uh, in Buckminster Fuller's program that I mentioned um, and ultimately transitioned to a blockchain fellowship, uh, which the talk I'll give later covers a little bit more. Uh, but it, it does, it did come with this premise of how, how can we really decentralize uh, climate uh, par climate uh, solution participation. And I did want to just shout out the team real quick that joined Mission 19. It feels like forever, but uh, this was a really great experience for us. And I encourage everybody to, to check out TrimTab. Um, but what we arrived at uh, was uh, the, the, the notion that education and action really uh, are within one system. So uh, education uh, by itself is, you know, responsible in exposing us to 
solutions of our, our problems of today. And those can be shortlisted in, in this logo that we co-created as a group. We try to identify many of those topics and activities from pollination to um, um, uh, soil building and composting. Um, and uh, ultimately the, the role of trees and, and reforestation, which, which I'll expand with Sylvie. Um, but we are terming this circular STEM. And so uh, circular economy, for those of you who don't understand, takes into account externalities. Uh, uh, but STEM as a, as a, as a field, uh, as, as a sort of the, the future uh, job markets and really the roles of, of the future a science, technolo technology, engineering, and math is still missing a guiding force. And that's the curriculum that's, that we try to infuse together, circularity within STEM. And to unpack a little bit more that, um, that uh, diagram that I had shared uh, just here, um, these, these are the, the, the topics and phenomena that education very much has to focus on. Um, they have incredible overlap with environmental science, uh, it does make learning the sciences a lot more fun. Environmental science is one of the fastest growing science categories today. Um, and it does benefit a lot from understanding closed loop systems. For one, because we live in, in one. We, the planet is very much um, a closed loop system. And getting that mindset uh, really opens the door to, to systems thinking. Uh, so Just Learn has positioned itself um, in in curating experiences and, and curricular activities uh, that bring this to the science classroom, bring this to homes. Um, and our first true um, tool is Planet Box. It, it's a laboratory. It's, a, uh, uh, it's called Planet Box because it brings planetary cycles into the classroom. And you can see it here. It's set up in, in science classrooms. Uh, we actually serve about 40,000 students today using this tool. Um, but it was our, our true first uh, uh, tool that we developed in the educational context. We had to develop a lot of curriculum for it. Um, but before even arriving at, at this curricular uh, alignment and um, uh, making it integrated into the, the formalities of public education and science standards, uh, we also uh, uh, improved its experience by, by supporting it with software. And there's a lot that we learned from creating software that manages ecology, that manages a system like aquaponics. Um, so the, the, the one thing I do, did want to highlight, however, is the idea of understanding an environment from a life cycle perspective. Um, so in this case, we can define the environment as an aquaponics system, as mentioned. It really comprises of a water component, um, a land component, an atmospheric component, and a light component. And uh, there's multiple steps and multiple milestones in arriving at a relatively sustainable and stable uh, ecosystem. But the logic that we, we built for that involves understanding, defining the very states of that ecosystem. For example, the inoculation part, uh, the inoculation period, which means adding bacteria, um, feeding that bacteria and moving um, the, the state of the ecosystem through its multiple stages. It's basically autopilot for aquaponics, but it truly has inspired us um, to think about uh, planetary restoration from, from, from that perspective. In the talk in, in, in three hours or just under, uh, we'll be exploring blockchain's role as a, as a whole, really where Web3 uh, meets climate. And I'll be highlighting a few other organizations working on this. Uh, but at least I did want to transition um, from, from this idea of an environment being a life cycle uh, to what ultimately birthed uh, Sylvie, which is a, a tree-specific protocol that I'll be covering uh, in, in a bit. And so as I segue to that, um, you know, we are all really familiar with the state of deforestation globally. Um, it is certainly one of the biggest challenges of our time and responsible for cascading uh, you know, collapses uh, th throughout habitats and ecosystem services. Uh, but the solution is very much uh, uh, a shared target globally, which is to put more trees in the ground. Um, roughly, we need a trillion trees. Um, we have lost more than a trillion trees since the agricultural age. But, it, but based on studies coming out of Europe and really around the world, a trillion tree target is something that is uh, 
achievable and would go a long, long way in putting a dent on, on atmospheric stability, on carbon, and even uh, on yeah, ecosystem services to support what does remain. And so this is what Sylvie is very much focused on. To summarize Sylvie, because this is not the full presentation on Sylvie, we have created a, a blockchain centric protocol uh, that uh, basically collateralizes the tree as, a, as a, a tree future, meaning trees take a while to grow. Usually the carbon markets today are just looking at carbon credits uh, and perhaps even carbon futures, but not necessarily the uh, what certifies those carbon credits or the very natural capital behind them. Um, but for, for us to hold tree planting account, accountable um, globally, um, to really be able to broker supply and demand, there's a lot of traceability that's still needed. And a lot has, has been done with remote sensing and satellite imagery, uh, but not to the precision that's needed to really keep track of, of small scale projects uh, around the world that might include and leverage a little bit more of that citizen uh, participation. Um, because uh, Sylvie is a spin-off of Just Learn, we see schools as a sort of an unexpected vector in, in reforestation, particularly schools, school grounds. Uh, tree planting is one of the most, or I might add, seed germination is one of the most popular uh, science activities in science classrooms. Uh, if only we could optimize this a little bit uh, to, to participate in reforestation. Um, uh, that's something we're very focused on doing. So in the talk later, we'll be uh, exploring how trees themselves are also an asset class with a life cycle that can be understood as multiple milestones and how uh, we are using blockchain for the holding of tree budget commitments in escrow and releasing them as trees are as, as tree milestones are verifiably met. It is a, a huge challenge. Uh, I don't think any anyone can do it alone. There's a lot of interoperability of data and uh, collaboration of, of data and goals. Uh, but we uh, at least are focusing on the distribution of tasks to citizens, to students, um, um, while brokering tree planting um, to, to, uh, for, to, towards tree planting demand. Um, it, there's an app that we've been building. It includes you know, map integrations and GIS, um, and we'll be exploring a little bit more. Uh, the pilots uh, we're involved in Africa, here in Florida, uh, we just onboarded one in Brazil, uh, but it, it does uh, kind of, uh, it is inspired by the Pokemon Go of sorts, uh, except it's for, for tree planting. So we'll be exploring that in a little bit more detail. And it was just uh, Earth Day, um, uh, I'm holding saplings. I actually have a thousand saplings at home, maybe a bit less. But our trees are being tagged by QR codes, and that app also supports that. So uh, in the upcoming talk, I'll be sharing a lot more about the role that blockchain uh, has on climate, uh, particularly the movement understood as the intersection of climate and Web3. And if you're interested in learning about natural capital and uh, maybe thinking about entering blockchain to, to, play, to participate in climate solutions, uh, uh, please uh, join my talk in a bit. Thank you. We lost you. <laughs> hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Beautiful. How long did you lose me for? No, no, no. Just for a second. Just for a second. I just wanted to say that was beautiful. And I, I love what you have come up with for Sylvie. I think there's, there's a, for one, the tree planting through use of the blockchain and Web3 is is ingenious and I feel like there's a lot of a lot of application and so would love to just learn more about that and we can all learn more at 2.30. Um, so please join Chimo um, to talk more about Sylvie at 2.30 and love to learn more also about Just Learn. So weaving a little bit more um, with Just Learn and the work that you've done. Um, awesome. Yeah, thanks again, Faith. There's so much to unpack, um, but uh, hopefully I was on time now and Look forward to to diving deeper later. Yeah, Thanks. you were incredible. Thank you. See you soon. See ya. And next up, we have our citizens of Regenera, Roxy. Hi. 
Or I don't know, what's your, what's your citizen of Regenera name? I'm sorry. Today, it's Roxy. <laughs> Today it's Roxy, okay. <laughs> Love it. Uh, depending right. on the day, we shape shift, you know. Beautiful. At this Take moment, in this, you know, 57th hour on the 33rd moon, I think it's, uh, it's Roxy. So <laughs> I just want to uh, also, Dimo, thank you so much for uh, being a patron of the Design Science Studio and uh, for all the work that you're doing to bridge education and collective action and culture building and, and understanding through all of these tools. And we really have felt uh, so like supported by you and your patronage and, and also your partnership. And I'm excited to see how we can weave more uh, with uh, our collective uh, dedication to education as this great equalizer and, and supporter of a uh, future that works for all life. So. Thank you. Thank you cheers, you. cheers. And, and speak for yourself. Uh, you're connecting the world and a lot of projects. So it's very inspiring. And I'm glad I came across your work. Thank you. I'm so excited for your talk in just a little bit. I'll be there uh, with skates on. Sk I don't even know where that saying comes from, skates on. <laughs> I guess I'll just skate around while you talk and I'll celebrate. Uh, yes, with all, with all due. Um, respect and, and gratitude. I wanna just thank all of the people who have shared so far. It takes a lot of courage to bring your brilliance and dedication and what you're doing to the world and it's really deeply inspiring. Uh, so far today, we've heard from two revolutionaries and three of our partners. So, uh, and we're only getting started. So with that, I am excited to share that we have a little bit of time for orientation. So I'm going to show y'all around uh, some of what's coming up. And then uh, we'll hear from the founder of Catalyst, uh, Vincent, one of the revolutionaries in the design science studio, who has uh, prepared a little orientation video for the platform. And, um, and then we'll hear from our Maestra of Consent, uh, sharing with us some of the principles of Regenera. And then I'll walk through some of the upcoming events and uh, share a little bit about our campaign. So that's all happening in the next few moments. And then we will hear from another partner at Angel Protocol. So here we go. Um, I'm not sure why this bar is up. There we go, cool. So first we'll start with the Catalyst tutorial, just so you understand how to use um, the central platform that we have for uh, navigating all of the events uh, and amazing speakers and uh, creators and making sure you can follow up with their great work. Either scroll down the page or use a purple bar at the top to jump to the section that you're looking for. Each event has different sections that are turned on and off. The Happening Now section shows everything currently going on with a quick way to either join the session or to preview what is happening. The check-in map is a module for virtual conferences, which allows attendees to see where everyone is calling in from. You can click on the different cards to see people's responses and where they checked in from, or you can click on them to see their response in a pop-up window and cycle through by clicking Next. The featured section is a way to showcase different speakers or presenters at a specific event. The agenda shows all the different sub-events for multi-session and multi-day conferences. There are lots of other sections, such as sponsors, related events, and comments, but let's dive into the agenda. This event is the Regenera Rising launch for the Design Science Studio. Pretty awesome. Each event has different views at the top right corner. The gallery view is best for exploration. The long card view is my personal favorite, which shows topics as well as the different stages. The list view is designed for a quick glance and easy ability to find events listed in chronological order. Calendar view gives a big picture view of the entire week.
for a multi-day event. And last, the timeline view. The timeline view is a detailed agenda that allows you to see events that are happening at the same time. You can also toggle between week or day view to be able to zoom in and see everything that's happening for the specific day that you're interested in. For all these views, you can change the way that the events are searched and filtered. For example, you can filter by topics. These filters will filter across all the different views. You'll be able to see that there are five events between April 21st and May 1st which have these topics. You can click on the X to remove any topic filters. You can also search by the session category and session types, for example, workshops. Each one of these views allows you to click on the particular cards and see a preview of what's happening with the date, information, as well as ways to either share, join the session if it's in progress, or add it to your calendar. These cards will also have the related information, such as participants or related events. Wonderful. So hopefully that helped you orient a little bit to Catalyst and how to use the platform. I will say that after two years of uh, having been running the Design Science Studio, getting close to two and a half. This is probably our smoothest uh, platform that we have been able to wrangle all of these interdependent uh, and interrelated creators sessions. And it's probably been the, the most, you know, I, the least, I will say, the, the least uh, feedback of people being disoriented. <laughs> So that's great. Hooray. It's working. Bravo. The city is evolving. Good job. <laughs> all, right, all right. All right. So speaking about the city, uh, we have one more message from a friend. And uh, this one is particularly important uh, for the rest of your day being successful. Welcome to Regenera, where our ideas build the city and those ideas work for 100% of all life. My name is Margie, and I will be your guardian of consent today. Here on Regenera and beyond, many hands can create a space of safety and love as we are all here together creating this container. An excellent way to continue to cultivate any space, especially a floating city, is to center consent. Consent is beyond permission. It takes into account that every human, every piece of life on earth has some sort of voice and deserves choices that cultivate a container of agency around oneself in any interaction. Consent is something that we engage in every day, from making decisions with friends, to asking someone for a hug, to telling someone no, and even to choose not to litter. While consent is something that we engage in every day, we also engage in non-consensual systems every day, such as capitalism, white supremacy, the patriarchy, and any system that forces us to participate in order to maintain power. The earth is regularly forgotten in conversations around consent and boundaries. How are we not listening to the earth's boundaries when the earth holds the most power of all? At its core, consent is regenerative. It is infinite and something that we can practice with one another and the planet every single day. It is freely given, uncoerced, and non-exclusive. It asks the question of, where do I hold power when I navigate this place? And how do I empower the agency of others with the power that I do have? As creators, change makers, artists, activists, teachers, and students, we must act with integrity, accountability, and love in our hearts as we usher in a new era. Love is also a regenerative gift that we give each other. Love has been commodified and has been placed in a box as something that is finite, 
when in reality, we can act in love every day, whenever we want, and love and consent are caring acts. It is both tangible and intangible. It is infinite. Love is a cornerstone in the foundation of Regenera. Digital boundaries are a newer and more nuanced sector of how consent operates. How will we continue to support one another in this space today as we meet globally across cultures on the internet? As we enter this space of questioning, discovery, and learning today, I encourage us all to get out of our comfort zones and to learn new concepts. Growth begins at the edge of your comfort zone, and sometimes emotional activation can be the vital tonic that we need to learn something new. I also encourage everyone to take care of yourselves and to take care of others today while engaging online. Together, we can create a new world that works for 100% of all life. I hope that you gain some new skills, engage with some incredible art, and enjoy the journey of Regenera Rising. Fantastic. So now that we're rooted and grounded in the platform and in ways that we can operate from a place of grounded consent and presence, I am going to share a little bit about uh, the Design Science Studio in addition to the uh, upcoming sessions. So to start out with and recenter where we are in space and time, uh, here we are on the, the sixth day of Regenera Rising, our second annual uh, event that is amplifying global creators in organizations, thought leaders, and initiatives coming together to support and propel the transition to a world that works for all of life. And today's theme is all about restoration and capital transfer. So this vision that we can move away from and towards a new generation of investing in regeneration and moving towards a world that has restored our relationship with each other and the land and bioremediation and moving away from just capital being focused on uh, profit incentives, but looking at all forms of capital, uh, in addition to capital transfer into the hands of those who wish to uh, be stewards of this land and our earth and uh, for the future generations to come. And so we've heard some incredible people and we're super grateful for all the ones that are still ahead. So what's ahead? Uh, this is a little screen share and it will show you the platform that uh, Vincent was just mentioning in the video. So as you can see, we here we are in the orientation to the day. Next, we have a partner experience with Sean Robinson that will begin shortly all about uh, DeFi primitive capable of redistribution of on-chain collective governance. This is all about Web3 one of our partners, Angel Protocol. Then we will hear the time weather report uh, from the Newosphere, and we will have a sound healing uh, that will be restorative uh, as restoration is key cornerstone of our day today. Uh, and then we will uh, come back to the session with Aliko Westy. That is all about returning to our houses of magic and art and design for restoring the collective Soma. And then we will have a conversation with uh, Ariel that is, I think maybe this one is an error. This is the one. Okay, great. So here we will have a session with um, Jimo, what we were just talking about, who is going to be speaking more about the work that he and their organization is doing to connect citizens and students to tree planting projects globally. Uh, we will have uh, Sage of Regenera sharing with us around 3.30 Pacific. Brian Krowitz from the Design Science Studio uh, will be sharing about the Unity Sanctuary uh, and his work as a revolutionary. We'll do some speed networking so we can all hang out with each other. Uh, and then we will start to get into the evening session for the, at least in the Western Hemisphere, it might be your morning, uh, which will include a session from visionary Catherine Connors talking about Poetopia 
moving from uh, looking at the root of poesis, poetry to make, cultivate, and the topos in place and position. So this is a, a follow-up to her first talk. Uh, and then we'll have a little bit deeper of a share about what is the design science studio and so much more. So with that, I, uh, I hope that you all tune in and uh, I'm gonna just share very briefly about the Design Science Studio, if this is new to you, uh, we are an educational incubator for the art of the Renaissance. And we have created this educational incubator to empower global creators to imagine this regenerative future that propels the transition to a world that works for all of life. And as you can see with all of the amazing creators, we are amplifying story to support social and systemic change, to create cultural shift, to reimagine life on our planet. And somehow in the only two years, we have made great ripples. We have had incredible events that have touched the world. We've amplified so many projects uh, and supported and scaffolded them with our partners, with our visionary educators and with our team. And we have uh, supported 288 creators in this program. And through this program, many people's lives have been touched and changed because of our collective mission to make the world work for all. And so we are in this conversation around restoration and capital transfer, uh, inviting everyone to help support uh, the Design Science Studio and our success in the world and our team, uh, because we are really excited to be stewards of all of these visions. And we are helping to support uh, capital transfer also to the hands of the culture changers uh, to awaken the world and to move us towards that world that works for all. So we have launched a, a campaign, which we can put in the chat, that is fundraising over the course of this uh, launch week to support the Design Science Studio. We have a goal of $60,000 over the course of the next few days to help us to bring many of the initiatives that we have in the works to life and to continue to support the work of these great artists. Just $1,500 can support a, one artist to complete a pro, this entire program and, uh, and also to weave together so many of our collaborators uh, who are committed to this mission as well. And so you're in the world of Regenera. We're also creating this green book, a collective artifact that you're all contributing to. And we have hundreds and hundreds of hours of content that we're excited to distribute to the world and make accessible to more people who are committed to this future. So thank you for being Regenerous. Uh, since we started the campaign, so far we've raised just over $1,000. So I will end there so we can introduce our next speaker, but I just wanna thank you all uh, for believing in this vision and for contributing in the ways that you can with your presence, uh, invite your people and uh, be present to amplify the work of these incredible creators from all around the world. And thank you for being a part of Regenera Rising. And with that, I will pass the mic over uh, to welcome our next speaker. And I just wanna thank everyone for contributing to support this work in the world. We believe in it uh, with all of our heart and soul and it is a nonprofit program. And so without your generous contributions as patrons of the arts, it cannot be what it is and it, it would not be what it is today. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and I will bring Faith back. Before we um, bring to Thank you, Roxy. And I did put a link into the chat. So if you are considering being generous and donating to the Design Science Studio, there's a link in the chat and we'll continue to post the link. Um, and for all you that are viewing on the stream, we will um, put a link in the chat for, or link in the, um, the description so that you can consider giving because we would love your support. And with that, we are um, shifting our focus over to um, a new company called Angel Protocol, um, which BFI has just uh, um, started to engage with in the last couple months. And we are really excited about our partnership with Angel Protocol. They're a charity platform that works off the blockchain, um, off Terra, and they work to, um, to make it easy for charities to set up endowments um, that potentially will give high returns. So if you're if you are a nonprofit or a charity organization, please just 
definitely listen in and um, you'll learn a lot at this at this discussion. Um, we're joined here by Sean Robinson, who is passionate about the intersection of Web3 and social impact. Um, he's a chief innovation officer of Angel Protocol, and he has spearheaded public private partnerships, uh, leading first federal, state, and, and local government social impact bonds, where Oh, while at social finance, while at social finance, okay, your last job, and previously started a nonprofit working alongside a community of waste pickers living alongside a landfill on the outskirts of Calcutta to advocate for a better access to health and educational programming. Well, that's really interesting, Sean. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite cool. You'd love to learn more about that. I think there's a breakout group after this as well. Oh, that'd be great. Thanks, I was Sean. realizing that was a, a really wordy intro that I typed up. <laughs> so right. apologies for that. <laughs> We're happy to have you and are really excited about learning more about <clears throat> Angel Protocol. So feel free to take it away. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction uh, and happy to present to you all today. Uh, as Faith said, my name is Sean Robinson. I am the Chief Innovation Officer at Angel Protocol. Um, I have some slides today. I know I have 20 minutes, so I'm going to try to go through quickly uh, and hopefully save a little bit of room at the end for questions. Um, just want to make sure I have my, my, can you all see the presentation? Oh, yes. Perfect. Okay. yes. Awesome. Great. So today, talking a little bit about wealth redistribution in web um, table of contents, uh, go a little bit into who we are as an organization before we uh, go a little bit deeper. Uh, but I broke it up into basically a, a four step phased approach that we are thinking about internally. The first is, as Faith mentioned, sustainable funding for charities, which we're really excited to, to have you all on board. The second is actually just embedding impact in the blockchain DNA, right? So how do you actually embed sustainable practices, equitable practices in the code that is being produced? The third is thinking about collective action um, and, and how you can actually use voting to distribute pooled resources to areas of need. Uh, and then the last is just talking about where we're going in the future. So what else is on a roadmap? Uh, and again, if any time, hopefully some, some questions and answers. So moving on to the next slide, uh, I won't walk through this completely, but I have our mission and vision here. Um, I think what's, what's really interesting here uh, is we are at the crux of blockchain and social impact. So Web3 and social impact. And really what we're doing is leveraging decentralized finance technology to create endowments. So cost-free endowments that grow in perpetuity. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more in terms of uh, win and help win and how we actually use incentives and our token to align incentives for the future. Uh, but really what we're trying to do is democratize access to these really powerful tools that have had pretty steep levels of bar barriers of entry, right? If you're thinking about opening up an endowment as a charity, historically, you would have about $20 million of revenue in your account to actually be able to afford those types of services. So what we're doing by providing something free, uh, hopefully is, is really increasing access to this type of tool. Awesome. So I'll break it down a little bit more. And the first is really thinking about the charity vertical as a whole. Um, when you think about the charity space, the fundraising space, it's really challenging. Um, in the U.S. alone, 30% of nonprofits face liquidity issues, and 50% have less of, than one month of operating reserves. And what that actually really equates to is nonprofits that are over-reliant on one-time donations and spend a significant portion of their time, resources, and money chasing down those donations. And that leads to really unpredictable cash flows, compromises the vision and goals of the organization, and most importantly, it increases the vulnerability of already high-stress environments, where a lot of times these organizations, these nonprofits, are the last line of defense for, for communities who have not had equal access to opportunities. And when those nonprofits do not have the ability for sustained fundraising, or funds, excuse me, the communities that they're working with become even more vulnerable, 
right? So that last line of defense is what we're really trying to bolster here. And when you think about how we are actually trying to do this through our, our endowment account, it is a cost-free endowment designed to grow and compound in perpetuity. Currently, that is 15 to 20% APY. We'll talk a little bit more in the next slide about like how that actually is even possible or feasible. Uh, it seems like a really just out there rate when you think about what traditional finance is actually offering. And when you think about the benefits of this type of account, obviously the first is increased revenue streams, right? So a little bit more predictability in the cash flow uh, of having a long-term reserves for nonprofits to stop chasing that one-by-one -one donation and start actually thinking a little bit more long-term, um, which is a, a huge opportunity for nonprofits. The second is it creates this really cool synergy between the cryptocurrency ecosystem where there are a lot of individuals who have windfalls of cash that are looking to do good, but don't have the necessary knowledge or connections to actually connect to impactful nonprofits that they care about. So what we are acting as is the linkage between this new, really engaged, really eager donor base and historical nonprofits who haven't had this type of technology or um, savvy kind of new uh, philanthropist type of individual. Um, the other couple points here uh, is thinking about what this looks like for nonprofits as a whole, right? The philanthropic space is rapidly evolving. The financial ecosystem is rapidly evolving. And this gives nonprofits a, a really cool marketing tool to, to say like, hey, like, this is what we're looking for. This is going to increase our transparency. All donations are going to be on chain. So there is a clear record of all activity that is happening here, right? So it, it improves financial transparency. Uh, it shows that organizations are willing to innovate and pilot and try new and exciting things to create financial sustainability. Um, there's just a lot of, of synergies here in terms of why this is advantageous for a nonprofit. And the last is the potential to receive automatic donations from the Angel Alliance, which I will talk about more when we get into the actual regenerative nature of what we are trying to do. Awesome. So let's talk about first the actual endowment primitive and how that works. So we have a, a pretty high level visualization here. And just to walk through this step by step, all charities on our platform are vetted, right? So in the US, they are incorporated 501c3 nonprofits. In other areas, we go by whatever the incorporating rule of law is in their respective countries. So these are all vetted nonprofits that are on our platform. When they open a, an account with us, they actually have two accounts. So they are given an endowment account, which is basically designed to be locked and compound in perpetuity. And they're given a liquid account, which is used to basically take money off of the terror ecosystem that we work and put it into their bank accounts to be used for daily activities. So as a donor, you would have the option to choose whether you want to give to their liquid account that could be used immediately or to their endowment account. So in this visualization, we have a donor who's donating $100 to a charity. They decide to give $20 for that immediate use, right? So that $20 is going to that liquid account that can be withdrawn at any point in time. $80 is going into their endowment account. And that endowment account taps into DeFi yield on the back end. And that DeFi yield right now, we're using what's called Anchor Protocol, which is one of the leading savings platforms on the Terra blockchain. And right now they have a fixed APY of 19.5% a year. So what we do in our endowment account, so if you take that $80 and assume that 20% interest is going to be generated, that's $16 a year. What we do, is we take 75% of that on a weekly basis and we send it to the liquid account and we take 25% and we just recapitalize it. So we add it to the principal. So every week those interest payments are continuing to increase. And over a long period of time, this $12 a year is continuing to grow over and over and over to the point where it will exceed that initial $100 donation. So essentially what you're doing is instead of just giving once, you're giving forever based on this endowment primitive. And Angel Protocol um, launched in April of 2021. 
Uh, it is really a pure creation of Web3. It was an individual who sent a tweet. That tweet then turned into a hackathon entry, which then turned into a small startup grant, uh, which now is this full platform, which is really, really exciting. Um, so just over literally like the last nine months that we've been live, we have a charity marketplace with over 150 endowments open. There are $2.2 million in donations that we've received already on the platform. When we bootstrap and kick this all off, we actually started with a climate justice campaign um, and that raised over $1.5 million. Uh, and it also provided a really innovative use case for NFTs, which I'm gonna walk through in a second. Um, the third thing that we've been able to do is mobilize really quickly, right? So we have this tech stack and what we can do with that is just move really, really fast and apply it to different areas. So after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we created a donation portal uh, for humanitarian relief, and that's already raised over $200,000. I think what's, again, another really cool point that gets back to the last slide of this gives charities a completely new way of fundraising. Uh, we have an ocean cleanup that was sponsored completely by an NFT project. They created, designed their own NFT. They found an uh, ocean-based conservancy organization on our platform, Pro2Tech, and all of the proceeds from the NFT sales went to Pro2Tech who then did a series of ocean cleanups based on those events. So this is where we've been. Um, it's, it's pretty exciting. I, I'm not sure, Faith, if this is going to be shared, but I hyperlinked kind of all of the, perfect, all of the areas where you can find more uh, in terms of just like the websites that we've launched and, and the organizations that these, these funds are going to. Cool. I will keep going. I see there's, okay. I was just checking the chat. John, I was just going to say that we also put them in the chat. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. So step one, when you think about this endowment primitive, is for nonprofits and charities. Step two is, okay, let's think about all these funds that are being created on the blockchain, this completely new generation of wealth that is being created, right? This, this isn't zero sum. All the wealth that's being created in crypto is new, right? And we have the opportunity to really embed impact principles in this system. And I think that that is not to be taken lightly. I think that that is something that Angel Protocol views as we are a steward in this. We are a pioneer in this. We need to focus on having equity. We need to focus on having people at the table. We need to focus on making sure that all of this is done with the right intent. And what we're trying to do here is really embed that impact ethos into just the blockchain DNA. So the first thing that we did is create what's called the Angel Alliance. So this is a group of over 100 businesses, protocols, NFT projects, and validators that are committed to support Angel Protocol. So the first is through smart contract commitments. And I think this is probably like the, the highest order, the first two bullet points is the way that the blockchain works is you are validating transactions on a block to block basis. With that, you can actually embed the code to refract some of those transaction fees to different areas on the chain. So what these protocols have actually committed to do is every time a transaction is being processed, a portion of that is going to angel protocol. So if you think of the future where now, almost every project that is building, being built on Terra is committing to this pledge. So they are signing up to give a portion of their revenue to impact to charity automatically just by the process of the blockchain existing. The second is a concept called locked for good. So we are in contact with all of these other tokens that are for profit in nature, but what they are doing is locking up some of their supply so if you think about how the market works, if there's more supply of something, the price is going to go down, right? If it's actively accessible in an open market, there's only so much demand. So instead of selling those tokens and giving them to charity, they're giving to us to lock forever. So we hold on to those tokens. They never enter the market. They never dilute the price. And what we do is we take the yield from those tokens and on a quarterly basis, we redirect those yield to the charity of the choice of that protocol. So we have an example of 
um, it, it's, it started as an NFT project. It's called Pleaser DAO. Um, they were in the news recently for, uh, I think that they, uh, an artist who sold an $80 million NFT then started this DAO that became this art collecting uh, way of raising funds. They then created their own token. We have $500,000 of their token. On a quarterly basis, they tell us which organizations they want to donate to charity. So this will happen in perpetuity, and we are looking to expand that across the ecosystem. The other way that Angel Alliance members can get on board is through one-time donations and or a portion of NFT sales and resales. Um, so I talked about the, the ocean cleanup that happened from an NFT sale. Um, there are plenty of NFT projects that are signing up, which is really, really exciting. And the last is booster support. So we, we've had, excuse me, I have the hiccups. We've had a lot, a lot of traction, which is great. Um, so a lot of individuals will help support us through podcasts, media, YouTube, et cetera. I think what's really cool um, about this is when I mentioned on-chain, right? So I said in the beginning, everything is verifiable. It's 100% transparent. So this is our Angel Alliance donation leaderboard to date. So you'll see some donators are pseudonymous, right? So it's just their actual like blockchain wallet address. Others are actually labeled. So you'll see amount donated. So this is uh, kind of like a Terra uh, ecosystem, over $880,000 donated. Luna Bulls NFT, Galactic Punks NFT are the two biggest projects, uh, NFT projects on the Terra blockchain. They've donated almost collectively $400,000. Um, so this is a significant amount of funds, right? And I think I just want to double down again in the essence that this is all programmed, right? So once they make this commitment, there is really no veering back because it's part of the smart contract. And I think what we want to do is embed that impact lens in all activity on the blockchain. And this is one way of doing it. The next way of embedding impacts in blockchain DNA is through the angel protocol validator. So in a blockchain ecosystem, I think proof of work and, and Bitcoin got a lot of media news in terms of the unsustainability. That is actually now kind of an outmoded, outdated mode of transaction. Um, so it's shifted from proof of work, which is really resource intensive supercomputers to what is now called proof of stake, which can be done just on my laptop. So I can help basically validate transactions on the blockchain just by staking my tokens through my laptop. And by helping support, you get a portion of the fees that are being transacted. So Angel Protocol runs a validator on the Terra blockchain. And 100% of the rewards of those transaction fees go directly to the incorporated nonprofits within our platform. So historically, we have used those rewards to actually give $1,000 a week for early onboarded charities. That's now shifted to $1,000 at point of sign up. And we are also able to really quickly mobilize disaster relief funds for Typhoon Ray uh, in the Philippines. What is very cool is individuals actually seed their own staking rewards by contributing to the Angel Protocol Validator because 100% goes straight to charity. If you were to stake with a, a traditional validator, you would get a portion of those rewards. We're saying, hey, these are all going to charity. So this is an altruistic act. Um, and even though no individuals are getting any proceeds from this action, we're still the 50th most staked to validator on the Terra network. So we're seeing significant traction here from over 100 protocols pledging automated donations to individuals pledging their, their Luna to stake for, for transaction fees. Um, and in the future, these rewards will be used for impact incubation, as well as governance-based um, distribution on the protocol. Cool. Awesome. So this is where things get really, really cool in my mind. So when you talk about shared economy and aligned incentives. So to date, we've mentioned kind of the charity endowment primitive, and then other inflows of cash, right? But now let's talk about what that actual user experience is like. So this is our 
waterfall or our fee structure. And you'll see that the yield generated from an endowment is being split and sent in multiple directions. So as I mentioned, that 15 to 20% yield, 90% of that yield will go straight to the charity. And then again, right, the 75% will go to the liquid account, the 25% will be recapitalized. 10% of the charity endowment yield is actually going to be split in a really interesting way. So the first is that it's split to this bonding curve. And I won't go into the technical details of that, but basically it is a way of sharing that interest with individuals who are supporting a nonprofit. So 90% of the yield will go to the, directly to the charity. 5% of the yield will go to you for supporting that organization. Another 5% will go to Angels Dano, which is our treasury. That treasury, becomes a really, really powerful mechanism to redistribute all of these windfalls, all of these inflows into what the community views as high impact projects or high impact nonprofits. And that is done through our HALO token. I'll go to the next slide. So when we think about how this is actually done, the Angel Protocol Endowment is really a river. And that river is getting lots of different inflows of funds from the validator, um, from all of the charity vertical fees, from as we expand into normal individual personal saving accounts, all the fees from that. They all pool and collect in the proto angel protocol endowment. From there, you can have offshoots, right? So different outflows of where those funds are going. Historically, they've gone to thousand dollars to nonprofits who open up an account with us. They've gone um, to the Restore Earth campaign that raised 1.5 million dollars. They've gone to the Hurricane uh, or, or Typhoon Ray uh, emergency relief funds. So Halo has its own utility here as it actually is the guardian of the river, right? So Halo gives you a say in how those funds are being distributed and how the protocol will continue to move in the future. So there is no individual figurehead here. It is a decentralized community of token holders who basically through alignment, vote on how to spend those dollars for impact. So an individual receives Halo based on donation matching. So the first way to actually get your hands on Halo, this governance token is by donating to charity. The second way is by buying it on an exchange, which you would with any traditional cryptocurrency. When you stake, again, so you can stake to a validator, which is Luna, but when you stake Halo, excuse me, you stake it to a charity and that acts as a curation signal. So that curation signal is an indication that this is a nonprofit that the community cares about that deems this nonprofit to be effective. The curation score is a litmus test for how you will receive automated donations from the Angel Alliance. So if you think about the top 100 curation scores over this month, we'll receive a percent, percentage of all the Angel Alliance funds raised that month and we'll continue to rotate it. Staking Halo to a charity also provides you future distributions of the Angel Protocol endowment alongside ongoing governance decisions. So. We had our first governance decision actually this year, which is really, really exciting. Um, and that was to, again, the, the Typhoon Ray, we raised over $500,000. We took over $500,000 from our validator and our AP endowment and redistributed it to Yellow Boat of Hope. Um, Yellow Boat of Hope is a grassroots nonprofit in the Philippines that specializes actually in transporting students to school uh, in flood prone areas. So they have a really high degree of efficiency when it comes to just general transportation and supply chain, um, which is what breaks down during natural disasters. Um, so we are partnering with them and they're also partnering with a bunch of other grassroots nonprofits to rebuild homes, rebuild boats, rebuild the fishing economy in the Philippines. That vote passed with a 99% approval rating and over a 50% turnout rating. And I think that 50% turnout rating to me was really, really surprising. Um, 
there's traditionally when you look at governance in the web three space, like a 5% turnout is impressive. And it was a 50% turnout and a 99% of people. Uh, and I think that really showcases kind of the, the intention here of the community, right? That, that people are willing and active and want to get engaged. It's just that these resources and the, these platforms don't exist yet. Uh, and it's really exciting to, to, to work for Angel Protocol and just see what we can do with this. So I'll end here. Um, when you think about that endowment primitive, right? There are so many use cases that you can build on top of it. And when you think about our fee structure, all endowments, whether they're impact-based or not, are actually impact vehicles because a percentage of the yield is automatically going to charity. So when we think about the future and what's on our roadmap, the first is just, hey, let's create this endowment for everyone, right? We've already democratized access to charities. It's a completely cost-free experience. How can we get that to underbanked uh, last mile banking areas, right? So let's just democratize access to personal DeFi powered growth funds, retirement accounts, college savings accounts, et cetera. The second is really thinking about impact-based vehicles on chain. So taking microfinance, which has a lot of historical challenges when you think about how you underwrite credit systems, how you track who actually has loans across different, non, across different um, lenders. Um, there are just a, a whole host of problems that could be solved or could be advanced through the transparency and effect effectiveness of transferring dollars on the blockchain. The second is universal basic income. And when you think about, again, all the wealth that is being created through cryptocurrency, right? Like it doesn't have to stay in the hands that it was created in and it shouldn't stay in those hands, right? We have a really, really awesome opportunity to start redistributing wealth, right? And when you think about the endowment primitive, you can use the yield to redistribute wealth, wealth without actually touching any of that principle. So it becomes this really powerful vehicle. Um, we have one organization who is piloting um, UBI cash transfers um, with their endowment account in MPG Uganda. Um, and that's actually going to be one of our incubation pilots too, to scale out. So they have over 100 girls uh, aged 12 to 18 that are now receiving a dollar a day. Uh, and they also started micro loans as well um, with small uh, enterprises. The next is self-help savings groups. Um, and this is uh, a savings technique that is really popularized in, in, in um, other countries in, in India, Af in the African continent, um, where essentially it's, it's a collective savings group. Uh, and you have pooled income coming in and you delegate vote on who is receiving that type of revenue streams in the future. This could very easily go on chain. Uh, and I think what's really cool, again, is just the endowment, right? It's that APY. It's making your money go further, last longer. Some other things that we are thinking about um, is, again, the, the lower cost of capital for traditional impact investing. Um, I, my previous job uh, was working with impact investors who are seeking return for social good. And I think that that is inherently attention, right? It's inherently an attention in value alignment. And by just basically reducing their return expectations by using the yield generated through DeFi, I think that we can unlock a lot of really exciting projects and bring different impact investors who previously had a higher rate of return expectation um, to the table to, to really create these really innovative financial vehicles. Um, the next thing that we're thinking about is a venture capital fund. So hey, we have this community who has a voting power, has a, has a say. So how can we collectively invest in promising social entrepreneurs in under-resourced communities? Um, the last two are further down the road, but basically create your own donor advised fund or your own foundation. What you can do is, is self-curate organizations that you care about that are on our platform and continue to perpetually donate, donate to them. And the last is showcasing your philanthropic Im and impact ind identity by leveling up your social avatar NFT. Um, this is uh, going to have a gain is gaining a lot of traction uh, in like the last quarter in the, the winter of last year, right? NFTs really, really swept. Um, and when you think about the social signaling and the value that they have, 
I think that there's going to be a lot of people pushing towards signaling. And one thing that we did, and I'll get back to the Restore Earth campaign, was donating to our climate campaign, you were able to get an NFT if you donated over $100. That NFT was created by Galactic Punks, which is the largest NFT platform. Uh, our largest NFT uh, creator on the Terra ecosystem blockchain. It has a really high retail. So you donate $100, you get a free NFT created by this really premier NFT artist group. Those NFTs are now retail selling for over $400, right? So you got a return on investment for donating. And every resale of these NFTs go back to our AP endowment, right? So it's just a way of recycling money and keeping it in the ecosystem that goes to impact. Awesome. Um, I think I went a little bit over, so I apologize. Um, but that, that is it. I really appreciate your time. Um, if you are interested in learning about more, um, I have some hyperlinks here. So if you want to onboard a charity, there's a form to fill out. If you're interested in being an Angel Alliance partner, I've linked to the proper email there. Curious about engaging in our community, um, that's a link to our Discord group. Uh, and then I provided my email as well. Thank you, Sean, so much for all that you've shared with us and for being a partner of the Design Science Studio. I've been in the cohort for the last two years. And, um, you know, first of all, I just have to say, I, I think I figured out why I woke up at 2.22, at 4.44, and then again at 5.55 this morning was because it was going to be all about numbers today. <laughs> and I was wondering, why, why is that? Yeah. And um, what I'd really like to ask you is, what's the thread in your life that's carried you through here that brought you to this very point in time. And then we're in the design science decade. We're anticipating, as Bucky would say, anticipatory design science, what the world will be like when we implement these beautiful ideas. What is that going to look like? What is the effect of what your intentions are? Yeah. Um, thank you for such a thoughtful question, I would say. Um, and I, I, I can go on for a very long time, so I don't want to. Keep it short. Um, I, I think what brought me here is kind of an amalgamation and lots and lots of failure of all of my past experiences. I think that I've had a really unique and fortunate opportunity to see development across a whole host of lenses, whether that's working for an impact investor in India, working for a social enterprise that crashed and burned in the ed tech space, working grassroots with um, Dalit communities, to then working in public policy and domestic-based policy in the U.S. with impact investors and philanthropic organizations. I feel like each time I got a little bit more disillusioned and a little bit more lost. And what really brought me to Angel Protocol was the decentralization of all of this, I think is really, really powerful. I think that I've been frustrated in the past with just vision and mission alignment when you have an individual figurehead at an organization. This democratizes that. And I think it provides a lot more input for other insight. I think that there's a long, long way to go, right? A long, long way to go, especially in the tech space. The same problems of representation are magnified here. And I think that that is a real, real challenge. When you talk about, hey, what do we envision this world to be? I would hope that we're thinking about the perils of capitalism and how we can shift to a more humane and conscious approach to living. And Finances by no means will fix deep, systemic, pervasive, highly contextual challenges, but it will help alleviate some of the burdens, right? And it will help make clearer decisions. And I think the first one that we want to do is provide that financial security for nonprofits. The second is really focusing on developing emerging, emerging economies and providing this tool to individuals there. 
And then I would hope as we think about this a little bit further, it's, you know, the notion of degrowth. What, why do we need to continue to grow, right? Let's think about more humane, more quality of life metrics that really matter. Um, and what's really cool here, and I'll end, is this is a digital community, right? No one on the Angel team knew each other before joining. And I think that that's a really powerful testament to where we're going, how individuals with similar interests can self-identify and self-coordinate. And that's where things get really, really cool when you think about coordination outside of institutions or historical institutions. Uh, but I will, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, but well, thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. That's, that's a thread that we wanna see woven. Thank you for beaming from your heart, sharing all that you've been doing. And that's a perfect entry into our Beamcast, into the newosphere that brings us all together into this commons of mind. And today, once again, we have Shantir with us, who weaves dreams upon the warp and loom of space and time, harmonizing the energetic threads of seemingly contrasting frequencies. Shant, what do we look for in today's new news? Yes, thank you, Mark. Um, and um, before I get into it, I'd like to invite uh, Roxy for a really quick announcement um, for an upcoming event. Thank you, Sean. Uh, and uh, thank you so much also to Sean for that wonderful session with Angel Protocol. Excited to see how our nonprofit program uh, might be a good fit for something like this. So uh, I got my eyeballs crossed a few minutes ago when I was doing the overview of the upcoming sessions because I remembered that this was a slightly different time and I was wrong. So this session that's coming up at two o'clock, so in one hour and 40 minutes, is called Regenerative Leadership uh, with Arielle Sullivan. And so this is going to be in a different room, but it is all about moving toward away from the hierarchical mechanistic model of organizations and uh, understanding that there's complexity in our current systems that require upgrading our tools and we are in this unique moment to redesign these systems and regenerative thinking honors diversity and uh, builds abundance and resilience so in order to have uh, regenerative economies and a regenerative future and restore our relationship with each other and the planet uh, studying and, and learning more about regenerative leadership and embodying it is critical uh, as a journey and, and uh, embodied journey so I uh, want to just invite everyone to learn more about Ariel. And uh, if this is interesting to you, at uh, two o'clock, this session will be happening. And uh, thanks to Aliko uh, for introducing us to Ariel. We're so excited for this uh, workshop later today. So that's all. And back over to you for the news. Thank you, Roxy. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark, as well. And we will get right into it right now. Let me just share screen. Welcome to the news, the natural order operating system for a time weather re-portal. We are going to be re-portaling into the new sphere. Um, just a brief word on time weather re-portals. Um, they're based on this idea that we are transitioning from the biosphere to the new sphere. And biosphere being all of life living on the planet and the newosphere being the conscious planetary mind, uh, the field of all of our minds connected. And um, we're in the middle with the technosphere and we're living in a world of 1260 mechanized time, 12 hours, 60 minutes, very linear. And this 1320 natural time that the news uh, loves to uh, share about is connected to nature uh, through the 13 moons and our bodies through our 20 fingers and toes and 13 joints in our body. And so the idea is that time is the atmosphere of our mind. So that's one definition. And 
if we order time, uh, then we can order our minds harmoniously, and uh, thus we can harmoniously order space and all the physical things in the world. Um, so this is a harmonized calendar system. Uh, calendar systems are like operating systems of the mind. And um, this will allow us to align to what's called the synchronic order, which is where synchronicities and miracles happen. So today's date on the Gregorian dating system is April 26, 2022. And with this new calendar system, the new Sirius uh, calendar system aligns to the star Sirius. Uh, and that's what makes it galactic. Uh, it's the 34th year, the 10th moon month, and the 23rd day. We will now enter the now sphere. The now sphere. Sorry, I just have to uh, do something real quick with the song because it has to loop. Okay. The now sphere, the natural order weather sphere, where we will talk about um, 4D solar galactic time. Okay. <laughs> Two calendars, the solar calendar and the galactic calendar. With the solar calendar, we'll talk about the energy of the year, then the moon, and then the seven day cycle that we're in. And then with the galactic calendar, we'll talk about 13 day cycle that we're on this journey of, and then the energy of today. So this is probably new information. So just take it easy, see what resonates in the words and the images that you see. And the whole point is that it, the whole theme and the cycles that we're in, um, as they become aware to you, as you, as you come into awareness of them, um, you can resonate and be guided to um, notice things in your life that uh, themes and events in your day in your life that uh, can help you evolve into your best uh, potential and self. So, okay, the solar calendar. We're in the yellow electric seed year from last July until this upcoming July. Uh, it's all about cultivating awareness um, for the purpose of service and uh, bonding with one another. So it's an activation year. It's the third year of a 13 year cycle. Um, and it's powered by creativity and elegance. So we have a couple more months of this energy. We're in the 10th moon month, the planetary moon. And this is where all of our uh, work in the last nine months um, is uh, culminating into a manifestation. Uh, we are questioning uh, how do we perfect what we do in the, and we're in the last week of this energy uh, where we're perfecting uh, what we've worked on. And so this is the last week and we can go into the seven day week cycle that we're in here. Um, it's actually this day. It is uh, in the last week we are acting to ripen what we've done in the last 20, uh, 20 something days. And um, this week's energy is how enlightenment stabilizes our uh, sense of being out of time. So um, now the galactic cycle. The 13 day cycle that we're on is the blue eagle. So this period uh, is all about vision and um, creating using the mind. So the eagle energy. And the fourth day of a 13 day cycle is about identifying the actual form that something will take. So today is a very concrete day of defining things measuring and defining form as we saw with um, the angel protocol uh, that was really defining how we use our monetary energy in new ways 
Um, and the white mirror, this is the day energy of the day, the white self-existing mirror, um, is all about um, what a mirror does. It reflects, it's all about order and, and reflecting and then all of mirrors where there's an, a sense of endlessness. So combine these two energies and you get something like this energy, may it help us see the bigger picture as we give shape and form to our projects and we can see in between the lines of what's real, what's a distortion, and what's um, actually something that is true. So um, we'll be guided by the power of magic and um, things that are enchanting and timeless. So, and also, I'd like to note, uh, thanks to um, our uh, fellow cohort members, Troopy, that we have updated the shape symbols and hexagons, which gives them a um, coherent flow uh, and changes a little bit of the feel. So, thank you for that. Questions that we can ask for today What form will our spiritual journey take? And do I use my discernment in giving shape and form to my projects? So um, really think about form, really think about mirror, mirroring effects and discernment as a result today, and you will be um, well on your way uh, on this 13-day cycle, the fourth day. So this is probably really important. It is a really important theme for how we manage money and restore ourselves. So. Um, there's, an, there's a synchronicity already in, in the alignment of the day. Thank you to these resources. Um, thank you to the source that we get um, everything from, um, the power of love. And um, this is brought to you by the news. If you'd like to connect, um, here's our email, the news channel, the email. And, uh, Thank you. Really grateful for this opportunity to share with you. Thank you, Shant, for bringing us the new news and for weaving a sensibility that beams to us and we can receive so sweetly from you. With that, we will be receiving Voices of the Earth from Claire. Claire is a mystical planet walker, a Samara, a pollinator, a connector of ideas and people, and a sound healer. Sit calmly, absorb what she's got to share with you because it will just resonate so deeply. Claire, are you here? Here she is. Hi Claire, welcome. We wrote you in the chat, just wanna make sure you saw it. I just saw that. I'll, I'll do my utmost. So excited that you're here. Thank you so much. What a beautiful, rich morning of just high level sharing. Ah, my volume is a bit low. Okay, I think I'm talking quietly. The first thing I want to do very briefly, because I put a, a, a creative call out for a spontaneous collaboration. And I'm gonna play you very briefly, like about a minute and a half of the piece that is asking for collaboration with visuals and video, anything really that it can go with. And it's a piece called I Can, and it feels very related to today. So I'm just going to share the computer sound for a minute and a half so that you can hear the piece that is calling for you to get in touch with me. When you were born, the angels sang. You are 
of beauty personified. Never doubt what you're capable of. Go into your heart Go into your heart and communicate your feelings to all those that you love. Celebrate your feelings. In all of their glory, Celebrate yourself now. Celebrate yourself right now. You are a gift. You are a gift. creation in all its forms and here you are beauty so imagine if however many of us shared some of our visual stuff and we could put it together I'd be happy to collaborate I'd love to do that so Mark I've put the volume back up so that it matches what we generated earlier. Are you saying it's still too low, Mark? Your voice right now is very low. Okay, let me do that again. Ah, how's that? Well, go ahead, go ahead into your singing and then we'll, we'll know. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to start with a poem that presented to me. Again, the serendipity is stunning. We are free. Chirological time beckons us forward. Into a time where we say yes with our imaginations and our intuition the spaciousness of non-linear time, to receive insights and impulses, to follow what might seem like random illogical ideas to a fully rational mind, to a chronological mind. The chirological is a gateway, a portal, a passageway to an ever evolving version of ourselves. We are heading in this direction with every social innovation that feeds the hungry, liberates the poor, lifts up the innovators, makes life kind, fair and sustainable, all while hearing the whispers of dreaming time.
Thank you, Claire. I have a Thank you. <laughs> You'll never. We are transitioning from isolation to community. 
from linear time to primordial, spatial, participatory, magical time to dreaming time. Kronos gives way to Kairos, to chirological time, the space that holds all reality, a pregnant void filled with its own anticipation, the spatial time that is the gateway to all things extraordinary. The numinous is becoming luminous, no longer incarcerated by singular binary truths, by opposing ends of an idea, of a thought. We are emerging into our own awareness of inseparable beauty. My pain is your pain, my joy, your joy, your needs, my service. We whirl dervish-like into ever-spiraling spatial time, ever toward the pinnacles of connection. I am you. If I truly see you, I see myself too. We reflect the cosmological possibilities of life dreaming, land, water and sky, all creatures dreaming us whole. We are so beautiful as we give of ourselves, of our bones, of our hearts, our love, and we are absolutely designed for just such beauty. There we go. Claire, we're sitting in silence because you've just sent us somewhere. All the comments in the thread have just been so amazing. Yeah. Maybe you turn your sound up a little bit now so we can hear your voice. Turn off the echo. So I have a little more time and perhaps I'll read this last piece of the writing into this shared silence then. We are no longer bound by linear time. We are no longer bound by linear time. We follow the moon and the tides, cyclical time. Imaginal realms are accessed by imaginative people, people who listen, who feel, who articulate a truth for its own sake, who design art to reveal the larger truths and who are free 
from the incarceration of clock time, connected, rather, to the radical liberation of belonging. The radical liberation of belonging. Loving, caring, seeing, recognising and innovating in sync with a universe that teaches us how to whirl in timeless time. Dervishes of love in action. When we step out of the control of clock time, we become the wise feminine rising, dancing with the wise masculine, creating form, creating relationship. Our innate knowing is relational, embodied, connected. We belong. We belong. Our guidance comes in beautiful and mystical ways leading us toward one another in love, in inspiration and in shared presence. No winners and no losers, just lovers of possibilities and inter-being. Time and space are talking, the masculine and feminine are talking, are dancing right here. Kronos can learn from Kairos and it is time for that bond to heal and manifest magical timing, magical life. Body-wise rather than clockwise. Yes, Strithi. And here we are, together, learning from each other, being loved by one another, recognising our wholeness together. It really is magical time right now. And the universe is listening to us as we listen and feel and connect and share our gifts. Namaste. Wow, 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 that was amazing. Everybody, hopefully we can all just take a nice, deep, collective breath together. Mm. Mm. Thank you. We have greatly enjoyed having you every day. Oh, is there an echo? I can't tell. Is there an echo going on? Magical mystical. There you go. Okay, sorry. I'm. I could easily just jump over to Roxy's. Uh, screen if I wanted to right now <laughs> from the cockpit of uh, Regenera. Um, it has been such a, a blessing today and uh, each of the days that you have helped really ground in uh, all of the shared knowledge that we've gotten from every single one of our partners today and our uh, revolutionaries the whole week. It's great. We're so excited. Uh, excited to be here with, this, with everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I'm also going to bring up, sorry, am I still echoing? It's, it's clear. Ah, that's where it is. Okay. And can we find Ariel as well? We've got one more I'm looking. Hello. There you are. Well, we, um, 
have, uh, we mentioned a little bit before, um, we've got Ariel coming uh, to do a session at two o'clock um, and we will post the um, link to the Zoom uh, once a little bit right before um, that session starts on regenerative um, leadership. And do you want to just say a couple of words about what you're going to be doing? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so hello, my name is Ariel Sullivan, and I am super passionate about the regenerative movement and have been studying it and um, synthesizing kind of a point of view around what are what's a competency framework for folks who want to create systems change. So I'm a I am a facilitator. I'm a convener. And I, my purpose is to facilitate regenerative systems change. And so my background is in um, creating change. And so I just love to offer kind of, um, yeah, what my point of view is on how, like, how to convene folks and how to create conditions for thriving and resilient and resiliency and abundance, particularly for organizations and um, like networks cross trans organizations um so yeah thank you for being thanks thanks for having me and um already just the frequency like my frequency just joining this last session like my whole field is um like buzzing and so there's something powerful in these convenings and and holding such potent spaces with one another yeah, absolutely. And speaking of convening, one of the reasons that you and so many other people in this uh, uh, in this program throughout the summit have been here because of Aliko, who has just generally uh, shared so much of his community and his network uh, with us, so that we can continue to uh, expand our uh, Regenera family and uh, expand the floating city in the sky. Um, so thank you again, Aliko. Um, I do believe that Ariel is uh, one of the first people that we have um, uh, from one of your recommendations. We also have Jamar uh, Smiley. Uh, oh, sorry, I almost forgot about Lux yesterday, who was absolutely amazing with uh, their uh, consent workshop. I can't believe I almost forgot that. Uh, but yeah, we've got Jamar coming tomorrow to do some spoken word, and we're just so blessed to have um, your family cross-pollinating with ours. Um, so yeah, I just wanna say gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. Um, totally. Yeah, Ariel's one of my best friends ever. We've been like really close for several years and um, so excited to be weaving um, really powerful magic up in the Pacific Northwest uh, across the Regenera Sky City. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you know, if I may take a moment to introduce you, once again, you're with us this morning. You're going to be um, returning to our houses of magic, art and design for restoring the collective summer. So you were born and raised in Seattle, Washington to a French Jewish mother and Caribbean father. You are first generation American trans black ex, presenting Jewish entrepreneur and producer. And you're founder of U Productions and Expansion Festival. And through your branding website, photography, videography, and event production, you're able to live out your dedication to carving out spaces for humanity through your work. I call that story living right? Living into your life fully to be all that you can be. Welcome. Thank you. Take us into your magic. Thank you, Mark. What a great introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to be presenting today. Such an honor to be here. Um, yes, I will be just an overview of my presentation. I'll be going into the history of capitalism and some of the things might be a little bit edgy for the body. So I invite you to just move and do whatever feels good because really an antidote to capitalism that I'll be talking about is embodiment. So um, there, 
I'll put a little bit of trigger warnings around um, just uh, sexual abuse and general um, violence. Um, and it won't be a lot long, but just want to put that out there. Um, and yeah, and then I will be going into some really magical things about returning to our houses of magic in terms of design and essentially returning to our bodies and what that means and how and why that is such a profound and powerful mechanism in these times to return to our bodies. <clears throat> Without further ado, I'll share my screen with y'all. Present. Okay, can everybody see? Yes? Yes, looks beautiful. Awesome. Great. Welcome. It's a little bit about me, you heard from Mark. Um, I'm not gonna go too much more into it. Um, but yeah, I, shameless plug, love the work I do. and blessed to do my work. Um, U Productions builds amazing brands. These are just some of many brands we've been able to build in the last year and a half um, from here in, <clears throat> in uh, the Pacific Northwest. Um, and the other half of our uh, work is events. So we just threw this amazing one last Friday, two Fridays ago, yes, um, called Here, Helping Each Other Remember Earth. And we had amazing, profound um, thought leaders and BIPOC poets and artists uh, speak at an amazing venue here in downtown Seattle. It was beautiful. And debuting, just launching about today and this week is Heart Expansion Festival. This is another one we're collaborating this year with um, some folks in Guatemala. Uh, it'll be up here in Seattle. We're doing um, heart-centered embodiment, cacao, um, and community. Uh, so if you're in the Pacific Northwest or have friends, uh, let them know that Heart Expansion Festival is happening at the end of August. Thanks for that. Okay, so what is your house of magic? I'll be referring to um, the house of magic as your body. Um, and also what was so beautiful about putting together this presentation was I really found the second layer of the house of magic, which is our spaces, which I'll be going into uh, a little bit later. So what does capitalism have to do with the body? Um, I think we all know, but it's a lot. It's a lot of uh, control over the mind, body, and spirit. Um, and I'll be going into a little bit about how that happened. The history of capitalism. Okay, so we're starting around 800 to 1400. We had some in Middle Age Europe, by the way, um, we had something called feudalism. In feudalism, people lived on these pieces of property called manors that were run by the lords, essentially. And they would live in community together and they would have some of their own personal fields, but then they would have to uh, work the Lord's fields as well. And they had to pay something called a tallage. This was before rent, so to, uh, to the state. So you would have to give your produce or your cows, pigs, and chickens, um, your livestock to pay essentially your rent. People did not like this. They would give their worst cows or their worst pigs and like rotten produce from the ground. And there was always, all, throughout this whole history lesson, I'll really be talking about the resistance to capitalism that was so deeply alive at this time, uh, in, in this time that so many of our ancestors did not want to participate and how we were shaped and carved into participating the way we do today. Um, also, gender roles, there were a lot, there was a lot more solidarity between genders in this time. Men and women would do the same work, wear similar clothes. People, it wasn't about male or female work, et cetera. It was work needed to be done in general. So people just did work. And then after work was done, life was about other things. Um, and women could also move, uh, move to the city and become, uh, have, have higher professions like uh, pharmacists and uh, doctors um, and they could live together. That became illegal later on. I will, I will share um, 
a little bit about that. And then there were also something that was alive at this time was the commons. And the commons, oh, I miss the commons was land. It was just land that was common land uh, that wasn't owned, that wasn't private. All land now is owned by someone. But imagine being able to go to a forest and it just be yours. Like it was a staple in the livelihood, uh, in the lifestyles of, um, of these people back then. Uh, it was also a really large financial foundation. Um, lots of people would go to the commons the, uh, to, gather, uh, to gather materials, whether it's firewood or herbs or flour, whatever, to sell at the market. And it was their financial foundation. So later on, when I talk about how that was taken away, um, people were super angry. And then we have the church and the state, woohoo, the Roman Empire came in and did the thing. Um, the church and the state uh, was starting to, at this time, to, to really develop a stronghold. Um, and we'll go into that a little bit more. So there was a transition time between um, feudalism and what we, what was the early stage capitalism um, back then. That's around 1200 to 1500. Um, where do I want to start? So let's start with rent. So essentially people didn't want to pay their rent or pay their tallage. So they didn't want to give their livestock anymore and they didn't want to give their produce. So the lords were like, the landlords were like, okay, if you don't want to give us tallage, you can give us money. And people felt free. They were like, yes, um, we don't have to pay tallage anymore. But what they didn't realize was that was the foundation for class division because some peasants had more money than others. So that had um, pe peasants working for other peasants and some peasants who didn't have any money couldn't pay. And uh, it started what we know as um, classism at, at the essentially like micro like economic uh, classism at the time. Um, urb urbanization also started to happen. So people started to move from manors to cities. Um, and through the creation of cities, uh, there was a lot of degradation of the land, um, which caused lots of, um, you know, that was the start of, uh, of the separation between nature and, um, and the body, essentially, um, that nature is now a resource for the machine. Um, there was also the famine between 1315 and 1317 uh, and a little bit after the Black Plague. So the famine, people were, you know, starving. So it was hard for them to work, um, hard, hard for them to reproduce. And that shows up a little bit later. Um, and then right soon after the Black Plague came and wiped like two thirds of the population. So all of a sudden you have way less people to work the capitalist machine. And people, there was a, there was a time between, right after the Black Plague and um, before um, the Enlightenment that essentially people had more power because there was less labor, uh, there was high labor demand and less labor. So, I love this fun fact. Um, the Wheel of Fortune tarot card, the Wheel of Fortune symbol was at the time like painted on uh, different, uh, like as graffiti, as like changes coming, there's changing of the times, the Wheel of Fortune, like we are getting our power back essentially. So, um, and then at the same time during this time, more resistance was uh, the heretics. Uh, maybe some of you have uh, heard of the heretics. Um, I call them, I think we are the modern day heretics, these people who oppose social hierarchy, people who oppose uh, the church and state, people who wanted to stay in their bodies. There's a great book called, um, <laughs> bless Ariel. Um, there's a great book called uh, The Movement of the Free Spirit by Raoul Venigam. Uh, that goes in and talks about these different movements. Um, and during this time, uh, one of the groups was called the Brethren of the Free Spirit. The other one um, was the Cathars. And these 
heretics um, essentially had safe houses all over uh, all over Europe. They were poly, they were queer, they were in their houses of magic. They were denouncing the church and the state. They were, some were choosing to live um, poor, like uh, live with uh, no capital essentially. So there's this transition that was happening to what we see as the rise of capitalism between 1200 and 1500. How's everybody doing? There's a lot of information, but I hope it's creating a beautiful story. Um, something called primitive accumulation. I'll start there. It's a Marxist term, and it refers to specifically land expropriation, but I've also heard it encompass the four things that capitalism needs to take a stronghold on society. So those four things, I've highlighted them in purple, are land expropriation, colonization of the Americas, women, sex, and bodies, construction of differences. Um, so during this time, the wage labor was also uh, becoming popularized essentially, but it was only for men. So this essentially like uh, confined women, to doing housework and sex work. Uh, and this is also a time where you see the rise of brothels, the church and the state both open brothels. And these, which, and why, why I'm talking about this is because brothel, brothels did this really wild thing where after hard days of work, men would go to the brothels for release and pleasure and just like relax. So it created an alliance between men and the state. Um, and we see the impacts of that even today. Um, also at this time, uh, the state, this is when you first start seeing public assistance, some people were so like, didn't have anything because of famine, because of whatever, you know, plague, plague, little plague start pops, were still popping up here and there. You see the first sign of public assistance. Um, I'm gonna go into a little bit about each of these areas of primitive accumulation. I'll start with land expropriation. There were the acts called the Enclosures Acts. Uh, from about 1600 to 1900, they privatized all land, um, taking away people's financial uh, foundation. And people were pissed, the resistance was real. Um, there were groups of people, uh, this is also where you see like hedges and fences, the first signs of hedges and fences um, essentially like marking private land and people did not love it at all. Uh, there were people called the, they were, there were resistance. Some of the resistance was, they were called the diggers and the fillers. So they would go and dig up the hedges and they would go and fill in the ditches and women at the time weren't allowed to go to uh, jail. So um, men would get dressed up as women and go fill in ditches and dig hedges up. They were taking away people's freedom. And this is where you see this and the land. And now you, you know, you look at real estate and you look at, um, redlining and you look at all of these ways that the history of privatizing land, what it has done from, uh, on our bodies and our culture today. Um, this is where I'm going to get into a little bit of rough stuff. It, it feels hard even for me to share sometimes. Um, women's sex and bodies. So women were confined to uh, sex work and housework. And that's where you see, you know, 1950s, like Victorian times, like all you can follow um, the thread of oppression of women uh, back around this time. Like I said before, women used to be able to live together and uh, be pharmacists and doctors and all kinds of things. And it became illegal for women to live together. Um, at some point it became legal for, rape was legalized only for poor women, um, creating even more division um, and hierarchy between the genders. Um, and this is also the time where, uh, where women, you know, in, in the plays in like Shakespeare plays, how all of the women in the plays were, were actually played by men. Um, 
women were confined to either being the nag, the witch, or the whore. Um, if your wife was a nag at the time, like you could parade your wife around a uh, town with like a cage on her head like this. And I, I, I follow this right to like what we did to, um, to the African people, you know, caging, caging them also beating them also. So what I'm, why I'm, there's why I'm speaking to the, this carnage and in, in the rise of capitalism be is because we blew this trauma through the rest of the world, but it really happened. Uh, what Resma Menachem, if you've read my grandmother's hands, calls white on white trauma. Um, bodies as well were uh, stolen. If uh, like people during the reign of Henry VIII, like um, they killed so many people, people were just dying. So they would steal people's bodies and cadaver them and open them up. And this was also a time where uh, they were examining the body to 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 and 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 essentially. Um, looking at it like a machine, taking it away from this organic thing to making it like a machine, like a heart pumps like an engine type of thing. And people were so angry, like they were like, you can't take the bodies of our loved ones, but they took them anyway. Um, so it was really, really hard on the body in many different ways. Um, killing people if they weren't participating, um, dragging them to this, through the streets if they were home, houseless, essentially. Thank God we don't do that today, but essentially we kind of do. Um, uh, construction of differences. Um, so talking about the constructions of differences between gender, also um, later on we'll see the constructions of differences between race. All right, the enlightenment. This is where the mental uh, part of capitalism kind of took a stronghold on um, people and society. So. Um, Thomas Hobbes and uh, Descartes um, were both two philosophers who really influenced the uh, cultural thought of, um, of the nobility in this time, the church and the state. Uh, Hobbes was the one who was like, the body is bestial, I think. He at some point, every time he did some sort of bestial act, like pooping or peeing or like having sex or something, he would have to do some sort of redeeming like um, act to like redeem his bestial like uh, nature. And what blows my mind, like this is where you see like Victorian era sort of mentality of like, ooh, like very proper, um, very separating from the body, very like farting's not okay, all of these things that used to be just part of life started the alienation and Hobbes really did started that. And Descartes was, um, I think therefore I am. So also creating separation between the mind and body. And what blows my mind is that two things. One is that this era is romanticized in our culture. Bridgeton, what else is out these days? Game of Thrones, all, I don't even know. I don't watch too much, um, but I, you know, hear through the grapevine. But it's all these period pieces romanticizing and glorifying these times when these are the times where, where people were losing their indigeneity and their, their connection to their body and to the land and nature. The second thing that blows my mind, I was talking to um, my good friend uh, Lux about this, is, is that these philosophies of Hobbes and Descartes, uh, who also prophesized that if we aren't, if people don't have government, we will ki all kill each other. Um, but it was philosophies that were creating in these, in these times when all this other turmoil, famine and fucking plague and all this stuff was going on. So these philosophies are the philosophies that influenced our world. I was thinking like, what? And, and at the same time, you know, and um, generations back, we have all these Eastern philosophers. We have all these um, Middle Eastern philosophers. We have philosophies from ancient philosophies from around the world, but it blows my mind. It's that these white Western philosophies are what our whole system today is founded on. And I like to ask the question: How would our lives feel if the philosophy, if 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 our culture was integrated with 
different philosophy from around the world. And what's amazing about like this event uh, uh, and all the people who are speaking today is that we are the philosophers of this of of our time. Like these are the thoughts that will be creating um, the f- the future. Uh, anyway, that's that's my spiel on um, the power of philosophy and and thought. Um, a little bit more. I talked about a little bit of all, all of this, but the alienation from people is in nature, um, making it a resource and not uh, something that people were connected with in the past, like cycles and working with the land and having feasts and festivals in the forest. It became this other. Uh, the machine, um, the mechanical philosophy, um, making our bodies into machine. This is when taught, like, time was really uh, implemented for for capitalism and a watch i'm wearing one right now um became this fancy thing to have you know where but actually what what it really means is that you're on capitalist time i'm and and it like how they spun how they spun um ideologies to ensure that people wanted to be capitalist people wanted to be uh not connected to their body wanted to be proper um one of the quotes uh from this great podcast is where i got a lot of this information and i'll share later uh they said how do you put the cages the bars behind your their people's own eyes and you can see that done in the media it's like have this thing because it'll make you cool the bars are behind our own eyes. So this is a time when that really started to happen. Whew. I'm gonna take a deep breath and a sip of water. I just wanna invite us to like move through. There's lots of grief that could come up for you. Um, through that, it does for me often. Um, I'll do a little semantic practice here in a second, but uh, I'll speak to first why this is relevant. And there's so many reasons why this is relevant. My hope in communicating this history to people is that we can epigenetically remember the resistance to capitalism that is in all of our ancestry. We did not want to participate. And if we can remember why we did not want to participate ancestrally and hold on to that strength and pull that to the future, and I think I think we can have a much stronger foundation moving forward. I also think that remember, like I have this theory um, that whiteness and white supremacy has made a deal with the devil in a way that whiteness says forget this pain forget what we did to you forget the carnage that happened to your women and to your bodies in exchange for privilege so when we take the time to look at the history we can follow the threads of what's why why if we're not productive do we feel like we're gonna die because we literally died if we weren't productive you know what i mean following these threads back and creating a deeper understanding is really important one last thing i'll speak to is uh social justice movements um things like land back uh, and black lives matter why like these movements are important not just because um because people are saying they are but because your land was taken from you too uh you know and when we examine everybody's pain body white brown black whatever it is we need to be able to see each other's pain body to be in right relationship with one another. Um, a fun fact in the colonies, uh, 13 colonies, poor white folks, 
Black folks and Indigenous folks were all in solidarity. They were in community together. It was, it, what we have today is a class war disguised as a race war. It was, it was classism. And what people did was they gave white people the ability to own land. The poor whites just a little bit more power. And that's all you have to do. Like everything else plays out. And I hope to communicate these things to remind people of uh, the solidarity between, um, between genders, between races, that it's not us against us, that it's not us against anyone really, but us against what breaks down our, 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 our mind and bodies. All right. Um, embodiment is one of the main cures to capitalism. That being said, I would love to invite us all to take a couple of deep breaths. Maybe feel your feet. Do a little body scan. Where do you feel this in your, in your body? All of our senses are front facing. Like taste, sight, smell, touch is all out front. So I wanna invite you kind of sink into your back body a little bit. It's a somatic therapist told me that it's like the ultimate place of rest back there. Can you feel the support of what's behind you? Can you feel the support of your ancestors, your good and well ancestors and your angels? You're held. Um, so what does art and design have to do with capitalism? Some of, uh, this is from a great book called The Proposal of the Feminine Economy by Jennifer Amberst. Um, and some of these are some of the values uh, that we are functioning in currently um, that she describes as the masculine economy, scarcity and consciousness, consciousness, perpetual uh, consumption, ego, myth of matriarchy, mer meritocracy, sorry, profit, worship, but vilification of poverty, domination of people in nature, materialism, ownership, hierarchy, stoicism, Competition, all of these are values that are really seated in our culture uh, and in capitalism today. Um, I, how does late stage capitalism make your body feel? Um, if you want to unmute and say something, uh, you're welcome to. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, how, how does late stage capitalism make your body feel? Trapped. Well, sometimes I'm really happy because it's the late stage and usually death comes after that. <laughs> Bless. <laughs> ah. Amazing. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a rough one. I'm, and if you want to answer that for yourself, that's cool too. Um, what do you think are some other possibilities? Uh, there's a great article that I have linked. I have linked all of my resources to everything at the end of, um, for a QR code, code at the end of this presentation. And this is from an article that I really love. So I'm gonna read this quote. For most of those of white European descent, our true selves are buried under not only the unconscious pain of unprocessed childhood trauma, everyone, AKA just also everyone, um, but also the colonial inheritance of a traumatized and tragically mistaken assumptions about what it is to, to be human. Uh, whenever you hear the refrain, there is no alternative. You are hearing the desperate cry for, 
of those who know that if they admit that there is and always has been an alternative of real relationship, then they will have to feel the depth of pain they have had inflicted on them. Um, there are so many other possibilities and that's why we're all gathered here today. Um, some of the other possibilities from the proposal of the feminine economy uh, are around business, but can be implemented into your life as well. Resourcefulness, mindfulness, gratitude, integrity, honesty, connecting to nature, empathy, care, intimacy, asking questions, let's say consent, uh, abundance consciousness, interdependence, collaboration, ease, generosity, some values that we can implement um, in practically in our, in our lives and in our businesses to shape other ways. What does this look like in practice in art and design? Uh, I wanna introduce you to a project uh, called GeoShip. Um, GeoShip is uh, started here in the Pacific Northwest on Vashon Island. Uh, yeah. And I had the honor of hosting the CEO and founder uh, at an event I did years ago called the Village Events, where I brought together um, amazing uh, people to talk about sustainability and community living. And that talk is recorded. I also have that linked um, at the end of this uh, presentation. But I'm going to go through some of the things that uh, Morgan Beershanks, the founder, uh, said about art and design, and especially uh, geometry. The architecture of the future is not building, building materials, it's sculpting energy. How do you get the right geometry and the right materials to facilitate centripetal charge flows? We want energy to fold into itself instead of radiation and radiation outward. One of my biggest passions is architecture. So I was so excited to be able to fold in how regeneration and architecture go hand in hand. So we are here uh, being supported by the Buckminster Fuller Institute. So Buckminster Fuller was the first to popularize the geodesic dome, which I think is really cool. And it just all fit into itself. I was like, cool, geoship, here we are. Um, uh, amazing. So Plato was actually the first to define uh, uh, the geodesic dome and he called it the cosmic receptacle or the container for becoming because it holds all five platonic solid, solids into the geodesic sphere. So what we have right now, uh, our current city plan is based off of the Roman grid. Uh, the Roman grid, I'll just, I'll read, read this. The current system is all boxes built on the Roman grid. And the Roman grid was created by the Roman empire. When they would take over a territory, they would lay this grid down so the soldiers could stand at the intersections and control the population. The right angle is the maximum is the angle of maximum destructive interference. And we can see this anywhere. When you put up water or wind to a right angle, it scatters the energy. So it's maximum destructive interference. Um, I thought this was so fascinating because the way our, we weren't always, we think things are the way they are because they are what they are now, but things were system, systematically create, designed to be oppressive um, and to be controlling. Um, and we have the opportunity, if we know the history, we have an opportunity to uh, build uh, a new way. And know the mechanisms of the history, really. Biogeometry, um, there's a great Egyptian architect, his name is Ibrahim Karim, who uh, was the first physicist, one of the first physicists to qualitatively test um, on the human body instead of quantitatively test on the human body. Um, and he was really what one of the, he's still alive. Uh, he was testing, one of the things he tested was how geometry, different geom 
ge geometric symbols uh, and signatures um, impacted the energy of the human body. And he found that certain angles and energy flows uh, resonate biologically. Uh, he discovered that when the body is exposed to certain symbols and geometric signatures, that the body will resonate with the one it needs to resonate with, that there is an innate wisdom in the body. An example of this is in Switzerland. Um, Switzerland's one of the most eco-conscious uh, countries in the world, if not the most eco-conscious country in the world. Uh, and there was, uh, back in the 2000s, they were um, putting up cell phone towers uh, and they put one on top of this church. And essentially, uh, in the next few weeks, uh, people started to become really sick. Birds were leaving um, and people were like, what's going on? The, the electromagnetic radiation, uh, they theorized was, was causing this. So essentially, they brought Ibrahim Karim in, who made these biogeometric statues, essentially, uh, that and signatures that pointed towards the cell phone tower and uh what i loved what morgan said it was like a, a moving prayer essentially like a, a an energetic prayer uh towards the cell phone towers and within a couple weeks like 70 percent of the illnesses disappeared and the birds returned and switzerland was like hey ibrahim uh do you want to do the whole country um so Switzerland has some uh, great electromagnetic protection, protection um, in its city planning and its structure. Um, pyramids and domes essentially amplify the energy in a space. When we have the right geometry and the right material, we can create biological capacitors that build centripetal charge within a space. Arch architects will understand how materials and geometry need to work in order for architecture to have purpose again, besides just shelter. Uh, I'm blessed to be starting work, working with the Solar Point Society magazine, who um, is an, arch an architecture magazine for uh, regenerative future. I've been into architecture, um, on the side for a very long time and to have it, to see how it folds into um, my passion and, and the creation of a new world is, has been so beautiful for my body to uh, receive and um, sh also show other folks what's possible in architecture and not only what, but why it, it's so important for our houses of magic. Can we build not only houses of magic within our selves but houses of magic in our environments that can reflect and support our bodies um geoship i'll just let you know where they are right now they just finished um a prototype in california and they are taking it to market and will hopefully be on market in the next two years what also what they're doing is amazing is that they're gifting some of their first um, structures to uh, indigenous folks. Um, last time I heard it was here in Washington state, but since they've been moving around the West Coast, uh, it might also include California. So that's really exciting. And this is what reparations really looks like. Um, you know, we can't give everything, but we can give what we, what we have um, to be accountable and start to mend and heal the wounds of everything I just described at the beginning of this presentation. And not only that, but every act of love for yourself that you do for yourself and your friends and your family and, and the houseless person on the street, all of these acts of love um, that we do to take care of ourselves and another is also reparations from the carnage that I just described from at the first part of this presentation. So really implementing um, that we are here to repair. And that looks like so many different ways. What does that look like to you? What does that look like for, you know, the community you, you inhabit? What does that look like for other communities in your area? Um, we're here to repair and that is reparations. 
we may not be responsible for the world that created our minds, but we can take responsibility for the mind with which we create our world. Gaber Mate. Um, I want to end this last 15 minutes with some practical ways that we can uh, shift into um, this new, all these new values um, and practical ways that we can shift uh, into uh, these new ways of being and understanding where we've come from to, you know, make this a landmark, essentially, where we can shift and change uh, what we do for the future. One of those things is redefining success. As a business owner, I work with a lot of people. I work with amazing somatic therapy, like therapists and uh, just systems revolution, thinkers and revolutionaries and, um, and to be able to support them in their success has been so rewarding. I do, I, I live for the smile on people's faces when they feel reflected in, in design and in art. Um, I think capitalism has made us a monoculture. Everybody and everything is very similar. It's the same, same houses, same schools, same standardized tests. And a, a, a antidote to cap, another antidote to capitalism is uniqueness, is individuality, in, not individuality in terms of separation, but um, appreci appreciation for our uniqueness and reflecting that in what we wear, um, how we talk, who we are as, as people. Um, someone once told me that success is being able to give yourself all the things that you want. It's not some standard that our culture, I mean, it is, but it, and how do we re redefine it? It's not some standard that our culture defines for us, but how do you define success for yourself? So I just pulled this also from um, the proposal for the feminine economy, but she says, I'm proposing business as a site to embody our values, create new economies and experiment with new distributions of power and resources. Um, I love this. Uh, she says, 100 ways to make more money. I'm not going to read all of them, but I'm going to pick and choose. This is ways to redefine success in our personal and daily lives to, to take care of our mind, body, and spirit. Um, when I started taking care of my mind and going to the forest before I had a meeting and going on a walk before I have meetings for work and, and, and making sure like, you know, having my tea in the morning, whatever it is, when I started taking care of my body, my work, my purpose work flourished um, and it's all connected. So hundred ways to make more money, drink water, go to bed on time. I don't do that. Um, <laughs> uh, slow down, invite your heroes to lunch, make a list of everything you're good at, tell people exactly how to utilize you, make no assumptions, have no expectations, improvise, be resourceful. Remember you have everything you need. This is true. Um, give meaningful gifts, tell the truth, talk numbers, read Karl Marx, woohoo, do it. Uh, connect with someone you love daily. Uh, Begin doing everything you know you should be doing. Show up. Presume is innocence. Um, remember what other people think of you isn't your business. Embrace vulnerability. Practice courage and compassion in the face of fear. Give money to buskers and panhandlers. Know exactly how much debt you have. Keep imagining abundance. Wake up early. Exercise. Pay your taxes gladly. Read the newspaper daily. Become a better listener, ask more questions, maintain eye contact. Forgive yourself for all the times you've devalued yourself. Say no to work you don't believe in. Trust your intuition. Become conscious, know why you do what you do with money. Write about any shame you feel around money. Talk freely about finances with friends and family. Make choices in alignment with your personal honor code. Act with intention. Stop eating food your body doesn't like. Shop at farmer's markets whenever possible. Purge the things in your life you don't need, use, or want. 
give unwanted goods to charity or have a garage sale. <clears throat> Get a dog or a cat or a child <laughs> or a lover if you don't have one already. Talk more about what you love. Through iteration, experimentation, and innovation, in other words, treating business as art, it is possible that we will find a way out of dysfunction of where we are now and into something new. Yeah, that's what I got for y'all. Wow. Aliko, thank you so much. Um, that was, that was so, so, so deep, you know, going deep to, to so many roots of, of the, the world that we are witnessing today, you know, the, the, the one that is so removed and so superficial in so many ways and it's the first time i've i've had the pleasure to to experience you and it really i feel like you know as if i'd known you forever and um the 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 movement that you took us through in terms of taking us back to who we are before we've been told to be something we're not you know i think this is so 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 necessary to share with the world right now you know to share with everyone because nobody really understands who they are anymore how could they you know and as you said as Anybody who says there is no alternative, you know, maybe they have just never heard of it, but they're also afraid because they, the way they've been conditioned is one of fear. And, you know, in the end, it comes back to this. You spoke of the Romans, you spoke of the civilization part, you know, I think you know, the roots lie even deeper than capitalism, because that's an outcome of colonialism that came before in civilization. And, you know, how they say, uh, Babylon system is a system of mental slavery. And it's none but ourselves that can free our minds to return to the roots culture. And to learn how to be thinking, being, creating, and be whole without the box. Because that is where universe is calling us to, to become who we truly are, which is one, inside, outside, and around ourselves. So I am very blessed to have learned about another one of my kind out here with me on the sphere of life and I'm looking forward to whatever other chances we get to link up and, you know, let go and let it be, let it be whole and heal, heal what was broken. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I love all your geometry that Ibrahim Karim would be very proud. <laughs> um, and I wanted to say one last thing towards what you said at the end. I heard this quote once by one of my favorite teachers. Her name is Teal Swan. You might have heard of Teal Swan. She says, when you think you need to heal something, you already have an air of disapproval for that thing. And we might, we all, honestly, we, we disapprove of capitalism for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. And also, I think one of the words I've been using lately is integration mm -hmm. um, and integrating this, this history, integrating this knowledge and this new way of 
moving through the world with one another. You are magic. I'm so excited to weave with you. Um, thank you, everyone, for having me. And if, oh, oh, I had one, one last thing I wanted to share. Um, I don't have time to do uh, questions. You do, actually. You have I do. Minutes. Oh, great. I have time to do questions. Um, also, what was your name? Beautiful man with, uh, beautiful <laughs> human with the dreads. Yeah, Benji, uh, I'm, just, I'm just a human animal. And uh, some people call me Struppi, but I'm not so attached to the names, you know. Okay. So amazing to meet you, Struppi. Bless. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, um, I also have this QR code that you can go to a back a hidden page on my website where I put um, all of the all of my references. Essentially, uh, all of the history of capitalism came from two, a couple different places. I mean, it's all out there, all over the web, and um, the foundation of where uh, I learned this from was from. Rain Crow's work, uh, the village with the Village Mystery School in Oregon. Um, she goes through the history of ca capitalism the way I just did, um, and uses the books The Caliban and the Witch, which is also linked on this page, and the podcast. Uh, it's, you'll see three highlighted links. One of the podcasts is called the Book on Fire podcast, where because the book is really dense. Um, so there's two amazing uh, herbalists actually out of like West Virginia who go through the whole book um, in this podcast um, and tell, tell this story miraculously with a lot more information than I was able to give today. Um, so those links are on there. The proposal for the feminine economy, Morgan Beershank's um, uh, talk uh, with the village mixed faith about conscious geometry of consciousness. Um, my teachers are there and other links to my work as well. So feel free to screenshot that. But yeah, any, any questions I'm here for it? Well, I just wanted to first of all say that I, um, well, the question is how, I think I know, but I want to hear it anyway, mm -hmm. because I experienced a similar thing, I think. Um, where did your inquiry come from? Where did it arise from that you would you went in that direction of digging deep down? And thanks for that. That was great. Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, I am blessed in Seattle to have a really amazing community that Ariel, who you saw uh, earlier as a part of, we've, there's tons of us. Um, uh, and a group of folks, uh, my friends, were taking this class called The Burning Time Has Never Ended um, by Rain Crow uh, from the Village Mystery School. And she is the one who is uh, really st starting to disseminate this information. I'm just, I took that class as well. Um, and I've gone through the book and the podcast several times. Um, but I, the D digger, when I took this class, like the depth for me was like recognizing like all these threads of why the world is the way it is from the carnage of these times. Um, I was like, oh my God, this is the root. This is, I was like, this is how to heal racism. I remember like going over to my friend Tanya's house and like I made this huge map of 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 capital is like the timeline map i made this huge like written out map and i was like look well um and and i realized it's not only the way to um integrate like the carnage of uh you know black indigenous people of color and what happened and why that trauma was blown through everyone um i didn't mention this in my talk was but uh the capitalists, the nobility, the church and the state thought they were going to have enough people to run their system. But the famine and the plague killed so many people. So they were like, oh, hey, Africa, you're, that's a bunch of free labor, you know? And then we, you know, spiral out 
Out Into the Heart of Darkness, which is a great book about imperialism of Africa, by the way. Um, so yeah, it was just like, this root can be, up, if we uproot this root, like we can find the threads of why we are the way we are, why our bodies have so much anxiety, like we've been cut off, like our culture is very heady, you know, we were believed, we were made at a point, our, our ancestors, not very many generations ago, this is like six, 700 years ago, not even that long ago, were made to believe our bodies were disgusting. You know, why do we still think that? They've now made money off of that belief, you know? So, so I think looking at the threads can really um, and, and illuminate what's possible for the future. So thank you so much for that question. You seem amazing. find myself in this wild west world of zoom here we are oh. i could not have imagined the amount of wisdom that you just helped to make visible for so many and if we are in the business of restoring uh, that reparations process and coming to terms with what has been so we can move forward and and uh, embody a different way of being and, and hold that as dear to you, a different way of orienting in the world. And yeah, I'm just so grateful for the last hour that you have so carefully and lovingly crafted for everyone. And I, this is such a, a wealth of, of knowledge and, um, and a resource, you know, like the, there's something about the word resource too, like reimagining what it means, returning to source and knowing that there is so much more um, that the more that we can be connected to what has been, then the more that we can uh, help to navigate how we move forward. Uh, but if we're not able to see some of the unseen ties to our past, to capitalism, to the things that we get to decolonize and, and deconstruct and unlearn, uh, then it makes it really hard to, to move forward in a good way. And so this is such critical information and uh, you have presented this with so much care and grace and also with solutions, you know, just in, inviting everyone into embodiment and, and um, into a deeper knowing. Uh, I, I already opened this resource and started looking at all of this and I uh, shared it in the announcement channel for everyone too. So hopefully. amazing. Yeah, there's. Yeah, I just want to oh, so go for it. Go for it. Yeah, you're good. I just I just wanted to say these are incredible resources. So if you didn't get this link, please, please, please click on the um, on the code on the screen because, yeah, I, I'm just uh, bookmarking every single one of them right now. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I would, I want to highlight, um, I want to finish with a couple of things. Like I hope that everybody at some point today touches the earth. And I hope that everybody at some point today does something really uh, beautiful for their house of magic, for your body, and maybe for your external house of magic too. Um, and then the three resources. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bless. Um, the three main resources I would check out, I would really, if you want to know more about that history of capitalism, that podcast um, is amazing and a lot, but it's incredible. Um, there's also that article uh, that I quoted um, is in there as well. Um, I can't remember the author, but it's called like something around empathy and coming back to the heart trauma something something po politics trauma something um it's a very long article but it's also i'm so glad that this information is i'm not the only one talking about this other people are starting to talk about this a lot more um and that's linked there as well um and uh the geometry of consciousness is a short one hour podcast if you were more interested in uh the design aspects um it's been such an honor to share this with you uh, please reach out if you have any questions. My email is right there. Um, there's amazing resources on somatic therapy and healing. And um, I just take care of your house of magic for me. And I'll take care of mine. Thank you.
Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, Eliko. That was really beautiful in so many different ways. I love the weaving that you created with Fuller and the geometry of thinking and the principles. And I love that you're weaving, weaving with Morgan. Um, he's, yeah, he's incredible. Um, we'll also hear from him on Saturday. So he'll be here twice. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we all weave in the same circles. It's so it's really beautiful. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you because it's really, it's, it's a powerful conversation that you're holding. And I think we need to hear more of it and in all of the ways that you spoke to it. So just deep bow of gratitude. Yeah, thank, really, truly, Aliko, thank you. Um, and I hope that we can find more ways to amplify your voice and your work. And I'm so glad that, that today we've gotten to begin our journey kind of weaving and amplifying your voice and the voices of your community as part of our global family uh, and community. You are such uh, an inspiration and, um, and you have held this with a lot of grace. And uh, I feel like, you know, you, you, you also presenced it in a trauma-informed way and invited people in a way that was consensual and also, you know, revealed and discussed a lot of things that need, need to be brought to light in order for us to make a world that works for all of life and come to, come to a peaceful place with our history um, and, and do the work of detangling and, and moving forward and making a new system that makes the Thanks for having me. I'm excited to collaborate in the future. Uh, Y'all are amazing. Blessings. Yeah. Blessings. So Beautiful. Like building a big uh, in-person experience together. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I think next up we have Jimo, um, who, if you didn't hear from him earlier, you get the the pure joy and opportunity to hear from from him now. Um, he presented earlier on just kind of like a, the broad strokes of what Just Learn is and Sylvie. Um, he is a friend, um, a, a comrade, mentor, part of our community. Um, he originates from Mozambique um, and he lives in uh, Florida now and came and was part of the Regenaissance, if you didn't hear that earlier. Um, he also has been an integral part to the Buckminster Fuller community, Buckminster Fuller Institute community, sorry. Um, and he just recently launched Sylvie, which we'll be hearing a lot more about now. And I'm really excited to just say that he's a friend and I can't wait to start to invest in Sylvie because I feel like it's a really incredible platform and it's going to really um, escalate what happens in our future in terms of tree planting and really having some a clear carbon future. So welcome again, Jimo. It's good to have you back. Thank you, Faith. Uh, you're kind of forcing me to say that this is not financial advice, uh, but <laughs> we can talk about trees and uh, their implication in, in sort of so, uh, saving the world. Um, there, there's a lot of legal opportunities, I think, uh, with regards to how trees can be securities and how they should really be building blocks of currency, but we'll get to that um, in just a second. I will be retouching just a little bit on those uh, broad strokes of what we're working with. Uh, I, I am using just a few slides from the previous presentation, but uh, in this presentation, we'll be talking about the work of Sylvie, which sort of was conceptualized during the Buckminster Fuller Institute a few uh, months ago in the last cohort, um, and then through the work at Kernel, which is a, a Web3 fellowship. Um, I did want to just spend some time here on this slide, um, uh, which highlights a lot of tailwinds uh, around regenerative uh, uh, verticals uh, and marketplaces around the world. Uh, many of you might have heard of uh, uh, ESGs um, and maybe even some of the activity happening with carbon markets and carbon credits and carbon offsetting, uh, which you can see here on the left. So basically, a lot of things are coming together that are, are spearheading um, the, the, the opportunity that Web3 and decentralization and blockchain offer towards coordination um, and sort of the sense, sense of responsibility uh, for, for tackling climate change and solving environmental collapse and degradation. Um, 
our work before Sylvie has been and still exists uh, through uh, the, the public facing um, entity called Just Learn. It's an education technology startup. I founded it a couple of years ago. Uh, we are, are originally started in science classrooms, particularly indoors with, with curriculum, with environmental science uh, resources, tutorials, uh, tools, um, activities, video, video uh, tutorials as well. Um, a lot of professional development. We basically come to a school district um, and we train them with, with uh, subject matter expertise and um, bring to life a lot of topics that would otherwise be theoretical. But uh, more recently, we are supporting now citizen science um, as far away as in Africa, or originally where I'm from, but not the market that we used to serve. Um, so this is part of the, the technology convergence that is taking place. Um, the world not too long ago didn't even have supercomputers, and now we have them in our pockets, and, and they now cost $100, and uh, internet coverage is also spreading. Uh, so I see this as really a, a, a huge opportunity uh, to sort of on-ramp, uh, as it's called, um, a, a people into Web3. Um, if you're not sure with the term of on-ramping, uh, it just basically means being able to uh, live more natively in Web3 environments, uh, so almost like skipping skipping your bank. But there's a lot of demand for what uh, uh, can be done uh, around natural assets, uh, which which I'll give a little bit more of a primer on when we focus our, uh, when we shift our focus to to Web3. But so Sylvia is a part of Just Learn. We originally attended the last Buckminster Fuller Institute scored on regenerative agriculture, and then we attended the Gitcoin kernel. We graduated uh, the Buckminster Fuller uh, program with a circular design, uh, which we launched in, uh, in Fort, uh, Fort Myers in Florida. Um, but the circular design very quickly focused on trees and the, the supporting systems of trees. Um, originally, it was really a, a means of creating a temp, sort of templating uh, sustainable practices, regenerative activities, uh, from composting to renewable energy to pollinator ecosystem services. And over time, it has focused on trees. Uh, we have also spread our wings a little bit beyond the schools to include uh, stakeholders uh, that support the tree uh, value chain. Um, but these include nursery sites, subject matter experts, um, and often really just enthusiasts, enthusiasts in their area. The biggest learning lesson for us before we started supporting trees is understanding environments as, as life cycles. We had built this unit called Planet Box, which is an aquaponic system, um, as our first laboratory tool for science classrooms. Uh, we have achieved pretty good uh, uh, relationship with a few districts here in Florida, in, in Tampa, where we're based uh, in Hillsborough County, uh, we are in every high school, and this is a laboratory serving the, the fastest growth science category here in Florida, uh, which is good news because environmental science uh, really offers uh, insight into, into a regenerative future and into sort of the solutions behind uh, climate change and, and um, um, you know, all, 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 the, all the environmental problems we've discussed. Um, but so thinking about that logic, uh, which is the, 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 the logic around uh, environment life cycles and associated milestones be behind those life cycles, coupled with the tools that we had already developed beyond the hardware, more on the software side of things. Uh, so think dashboard, uh, data logging, uh, uh, alert systems, task managers, some of the community pieces with interfacing with schools and science classrooms. Um, instructionals, uh, uh, even things like timeline. Uh, we have now adopted trees as uh, an asset class. Um, so that is sort of the quick journey from Just Learn to Sylvie. Before I dive into Sylvie in, in, a, in a much more detail um, and try to understand it from the perspective of Web3, I just wanted to kind of uh, share a little bit more about uh, what I consider this intersection to be in Web3 uh, and climate. And in, in this page here, I have uh, a lot of uh, names and entities. Um, maybe some of you are familiar with them. Um, but we have entities like Celo, for example. These are layer one uh, blockchains, much like Ethereum, um, that are very aligned uh, to climate action. 
Um, uh, we, we are, we, 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 a lot of us have heard of uh, Charles Eisenstein's sacred economics work. Uh, Celo has adopted this as part of their reserve currency uh, mission. Um, so the world is, is waking up to, to natural capital. Uh, natural capital is, is basically uh, natural living capital, things like forests and rivers and um, uh, water credits, uh, not just carbon credits, but ecosystem credits, ecological credits, uh, indigenous uh, wisdom, uh, all things uh, uh, natural capital are making their way into sort of collateralized uh, value within, within currency. Not everybody is doing that, but there are people like Celo who are. And this is very promising because they are effectively issuing um, securities and money through reserve and treasury uh, that are adding value to that and accumulating these resources. Um, Celo actually uh, created the Climate Collective, uh, which a lot of these other projects are part of, um, but these are projects that are working um, in collaboration with one another to solve grand challenges. There is a, a, a map put together by uh, the Climate Collective uh, and also shown by Refi Dow. Um, that you can visit and see on the map on, on the website. It's, it's changing fast. The space is really just a few months old, I would say less than a year. Um, but uh, uh, feel free to, to go see some of these other entities. If you're already within blockchain, I'm sure you might have heard uh, about some of them. Kuletivu is a project in Curaçao uh, that is, is looking to tokenize all types of exchanges, uh, coordination, uh, but specifically within uh, a big island uh, environment with, uh, with, with much more control over inputs and imports and exports and things like that. Um, but they, they are working on natural capital and they are also working on permaculture practices and the incentivizing of sustainable food production, things like that. Astral is very interesting. Um, Astral is geofencing NFTs and thinking about the infrastructure side of interoperability. Um, so a lot of you might have heard of NFTs. I'll be exploring a little bit more of this implication with trees and what many people are calling NF trees. But it's, it's important to understand how the world is forming around NFTs and beyond art and beyond just representing uh, scarcity and, and tradable goods. Um, NFTs are uh, allowing for smart contract uh, uh, to be distributed uh, across various layers. And one of them is with uh, what's known as geofencing. And so a certain zone uh, is defined and then smart contracts can be scaled across all NFTs represented there. But it is great for interoperability, particularly when including other things like interplanetary file uh, system, uh, or perhaps for example, um, some of the ledger and registry work that uh, Regen Network is doing, uh, some of the storage uh, stuff that Filecoin is doing. We really need interoperability. And so that's why this is not just about climate work. This is really uh, so many innovations coming together that are creating a bit of an explosion in, in refi. I guess I should have started with, 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 with um, explaining the evolution from DeFi to refi. So um, about... Couple two years ago or, or so, we had really the first DeFi movements, which were was decentralized uh, money uh, uh, working for itself and for for those who participate in it. Uh, it's called decentralized finance. There's been an evolution of that. We consider ourselves now in DeFi 2.0. Uh, but uh, late last year, uh, we a lot of the attention has focused on leveraging those De DeFi tools to support regenerative finance. And so I would say that this is really the, the niche we can, we can call climate um, intersecting with Web3 as, as refi. And I, I think this is such a cool space in blockchain. Blockchain by itself is growing so quickly, too quickly to really keep up with everything. Um, but if you are interested in, in regenerative practices, um, just you know, Google refi and you'll see a ton of, of projects. Uh, to explore other projects, I would, however, go on, on refi DAO as they are a DAO supporting all other refi projects. Um, okay, so trees. Well, let's let's just, I guess, come to a couple agreements, uh, which is around some of the global targets that are 
shaping up for, for tree planting. Um, we're familiar with the Paris Agreement. Um, there has been uh, COP26, or part, as part of the Paris Agreement, uh, uh, I believe Article, Article 6 specifically. Um, and so all these uh, countries around the world, whoops, all these countries around the world are coming to, to agreements around the evolution of the carbon markets. Uh, from voluntary carbon markets to compliance carbon markets. Um, big institutions are claiming trillions and trillions of dollars of, of committed ESG uh, in, in, and impact uh, that, would, that would be steered towards uh, what I just described as natural capital. But at least we can, we can find some hope that the world is waking up to, to this problem of reforestation really being the foundation of climate and uh, degradation of, of habitats and whatnot. So uh, the one trillion tree target is is very much uh, a north north star for Sylvie, and everything we do is 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 trying to support this cause. Not that we can do it alone, uh, but that we can help at least um, build tools and resources and coordinations and techniques uh, to to get more people uh, to participate in tree planting. For context. Um, if we're to divide a trillion trees by the world's population, um, that's 125 trees per person. Uh, say we assume that half of those trees will be reforested under sort of industrial centralized um, uh, sort of large scale projects, uh, then what would remain is about one tree per person per year for us to within one generation meet these meet this target, um, I would say that that is a very achievable goal. Um, can't expect everybody to to want to plant trees, but I do believe that um, even just a, a, a few trees, if we were to bring this into our life a little bit more, we might all of a sudden be able to at least scale the emotional attachment and you know the 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 conscious awakening that society might might have four trees. Um, there are a lot of business cases for tree planting. Um, increasingly, it's, it's, it's thought that, you know, within the next trillion trees, we'll find um, the next billion users from a, from a commercialization perspective, that, that there's a lot of opportunity there. We're not necessarily looking at this from a, a money-making opportunity. We're thinking about this more from like a platform. How can we support other user adoption? A lot of people are working on meta metaverses and having metaverse uh, gamification that supports real world causes, for example. So how could we fill that, uh, that demand? Um, so a, a few weeks ago, we finally announced Sylvie uh, publicly. Uh, this was after um, the Buckminster Fuller program Last year, the beginning of this year, we initiated um, a fellowship with Kernel. I strongly recommend Kernel to everybody. You don't need to be very technical with, with Web3 or blockchain, but if you're thinking about this space, I highly recommend checking out Kernel. Um, so Kernel has uh, 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 its own collection of, of grants within Gitcoin. This is the Gitcoin page, and this is just a a quick uh, a, a screenshot of what uh, the Web3 grants can do for you. We ended up raising uh, uh, about $8,500 within 48 hours. Uh, that was just one grant round. It was the 13th round. There will be more. And uh, there's a lot of attention uh, to climate solutions, which has matching funds behind that. So if you're working on a project, that is regenerative or that even is just looking at Web3 as a whole, check out both Kernel and Gitcoin and feel free to, to ask me any questions around the applications or the, the setting up of, of these pages. Now, in, in this uh, announcement of Sylvie, we obviously pitched our solution, um, a bulk of which really involves uh, two things. Uh, one is to be able to incentivize tree planting. We need to figure out how this can actually work. Um, incentivizing both from a gamification perspective, making it interesting and fun and, and rewarding, uh, but also truly a monetary incentive, uh, being able to uh, pay for tree planting at scale without necessarily the, the old systems of reforestation and logging uh, in place. Um, 
And then the second uh, 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 part of the solution and really needed for gamification to happen is to just try to improve as much as possible while leveraging uh, the technologies we have access to today, uh, the traceability around those trees. So with traceability, one can both um, hold accountability on tree planting, have, have transparency um, on, on tree planting, which is one of the big problems of today. A lot of companies claim to be reforesting the world um, and you know, committing, guaranteeing tree planting, but there's no necessarily uh, a guaranteeing of, of, of um, old growth or maturing of forest canopy and the returning of bird populations. Uh, uh, and, and for that to happen, you really need to have traceability on trees over many, many years, or at least to be able to model with a high degree of confidence um, how that's coming to life. Now, the projects I did share earlier, uh, particularly uh, region network and the likes are doing a lot of work to be able to, to build these systems, to be able to infer information out of ecosystems coming together or carbon practices uh, improving in farmland, et cetera. So again, our focus is on tree as an asset class um, and making that data useful and interoperable for others to then certify carbon or cert certify other ecosystem services. I do also believe that the world has a lot of room for more uh, social media type of participation in, in climate. Uh, so the community effects uh, effectively uh, around uh, climate action. Um, and so traceability would, would extend beyond just having ground truth produced for trees, but have traceability around stewardship and participation and the community, uh, the communities around trees. So I'll cover that just a little bit more in the next slide. Um, our background with education also means that a lot of our work and early stages of piloting our technologies are focused on schools. As, as mentioned, we already have a bit of a background in environmental science, uh, in citizen science, and um, sort of curating uh, curriculum and, and, and um, activities. Uh, so we are leveraging that supply chain. I do think it's very, relevant. Uh, we have millions and millions of schools in science classrooms around the world, many more than nursery sites, for example. Science classrooms, uh, most popular activity is the germination of a seed across K-12, even into, into um, higher ed. Things like genetics are, are usually in, involved botany, um, but we, we germinate seeds to learn about physiology and anatomy and metabolisms and you know we see leaves under the microscope so it's just such a cool uh, environment that already exists with with a good appetite for for botany and for gardening um, it just a little bit of an optimization is needed to maybe shift growing lettuce in ziplocs on your window to maybe sourcing non-invasive trees that will have ecological impact near you um, and, and ultimately stewarding them until they make their way on the ground. Um, okay, so I guess this is the, the most important slide to understand um, uh, what we're doing. Um, to, re, to, to kind of uh, emphasize on how we're treating the tree as an asset class, we, we consider the tree individually as, as a unit um, representing obviously the tree asset class. A lot of people are, are you know, calculating um, number of trees within an area or you know, creating NFTs around a given um, square, an acre, for example. Um, we're, we're thinking about the trees individually per, on the unit economic level. Uh, and I, I'll explain why in the next slide, but because we're issuing tokens, governance tokens that represent, that represent the tree commitment budget. And so the tree asset class, if you think of it as a, as a life cycle, it does involve various milestones, um, all the way from researching the right tree for the right area, uh, it, which we have many, many thousands of species of trees. Um, but as a result, we, we have you know, trees that are invasive and trees that are native, and it, we do need to optimize for that. And so in the early state, in the beginning of this life cycle is really the research and the proposals around trees, which should be incentivized, uh, it should be rewarded. Um, but very quickly, we can see some other familiar uh, states or stages of the tree. 
Um, we are very familiar with planting, and that's really the most the first thing that comes to mind when we think of reforestation is is planting uh, trees, putting them on the ground. Um, but we don't think as much uh, about what it might take to get a tree in the ideal um, maturity for planting, um, the timing of that planting with rain season, maybe some of the interventions needed uh, shortly after to keep to improve its survivability. Uh, but certainly the verifications uh, around that tree still existing, having survived um, and coming to life. So th this is just an example using $1 as what the tree commitment budget might be. Um, it's difficult to think about this from individual trees because nobody will make a living out of planting one tree to, to make $1 uh, for that work. But because reforestation really involves hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of, of trees, this might make a lot of sense for larger scale projects, particularly in Africa, which I'll share our, our big pilot. Um, and so with blockchain, with Web3, uh, one is able to commit a certain budget towards a tree being planted in a certain area following a certain tree protocol. Um, and that budget is released as milestones are verifiably met. Uh, blockchain is solving things like reputation, um, cyber resistance. Uh, so it's really not up to us, uh, but we are uh, leveraging these innovations to be able to build you know, reputation uh, systems within the communities of validators and tree planters and tree stewards. Um, this would be very important to be able to front tree projects. As long as we can build statistical confidence that trees will make their will survive through maturity and through carbon capture and through forest restoration, all of a sudden we're thinking of, of the tree as a security that, that we're producing a tree future around. And then we can trade those tree futures and we can also fund those tree futures. So the, the, the carbon markets involve carbon futures. This is just a, a bit of a step ahead in thinking about tree futures, not limited to carbon credits, but uh, potentially all types of ecosystem credits. Uh, again, uh, a region network, for example, is not just working on carbon like Tucon is, and even the carbon credits are evolving from uh, more into um, nature-based solutions that are more uh, sort of uh, complex and holistic. Um, but for, for, for those of you um, interested in, in really how this comes together from a blockchain perspective, um, trees, uh, sorry, we, we would have a dual token system. Um, one would be a governance token. Uh, we're working on these smart contracts through an through early a partnership grant. Uh, hopefully some announcements will, will come out uh, soon. But as a dual, dual token system, our governance token would reflect a tree. Uh, uh, so we would not be issuing tokens that are not uh, funded by, by tree commitments. Uh, they would be issued as pairs. Um, and one is more of an ERC-20 uh, style token. Perhaps this, this can evolve into uh, being deployed in, in, in amongst the more most efficient uh, blockchain layers or, or layer twos. Uh, but the other are NFTs representing the, the trees themselves. So the NFTs would hold the ID of a tree, uh, the metadata of the tree, such as the participants, the timestamps, the smart contracts, um, and those milestones being verifiably met. Uh, because there are all types of tree planting difficulties around the world, think labor markets alone, for example, um, it might cost more to plant in Kenya than to plant in, in, uh, in, in Florida. Uh, so the, the, the governance token would be normalized as seen here, which is basically the, the, the public markets token but then we would have different baskets uh, that would really represent the different uh, price points or market conditions for those trees. Uh, things like risk-free value and, um, and, and, and the market price would, would obviously be normalized against the governance token. So uh, we, we are, we're, we're hiring and looking for developers, particularly Solidity and smart contract developers. If you or anyone you know might be interested in, in chatting about this, we'd, we'd totally love to. Um, but yeah, beyond that, there's a bunch of tokenization that's that's needed uh, to support, you know, things like registering a tree, locating a tree, verifying a tree, um, 
logging an observation or an intervention or a proof of watering, for example. And this is all being built uh, within the app, the Sylvie app. Uh, originally, we started in, in, uh, in Florida as part of the greater uh, circular design incorporating all of the Just Learn app. And since then, uh, we've really refined this to support the tree life cycle as was described a couple of slides ago. Uh, so basically this app supports more asset classes than trees, uh, including like aquaponic systems and beach cleanups and ponds and, 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 and um, lakes and stuff. Uh, but for the tree, it, it, we, we've shortlisted a couple of data points that are collected automatically and others that, are, that have to be input um, depending on what state of, of the tree you're in. Right now at home, I'm germinating and propagating trees. I try to bring some of those photos into the slides uh, uh, later on in this presentation. So I'll be covering that um, in just a bit more. But there's a lot of GIS um, work within the app um, and zoning um, and um, uh, co co coordinate imp uh, improvements. So you know, as you, as you know, phones are quite accurate. They've become very accurate with coordinate systems, but not super, super precise. So there are techniques around uh, uh, building more accurate uh, co coordinates, uh, uh, which involve multi-sequence scanning and uh, multi-phone sort of averaging of the numbers. And it's it's again it's it's kind of reputation techniques from from blockchain. So I've described a little bit the the tree life cycle um, and the various milestones. You know, it turns out that all these in, entities and stakeholders have already exist and already support uh, tree planting and germination and, and, and everything. We came out of the, of the Buckminster Fuller program, uh, the TrimTab, Space Camp Tri TrimTab, uh, launching in Fort Myers. And, it, and I mentioned that it's now very focused on trees, but it all starts with a high school supported by local uh, uh, partners and, and subject matter experts, uh, such as nature centers and permaculture gardens, um, and even nursery sites. In this case, a nursery site that, uh, has, that focuses on native trees. Um, and so throughout the tree life cycle or the tree supply chain, if, if that is easier to understand, all these stakeholders come into play. Um, one of the difficulties with schools for us so far has been over summer, uh, what to do about caring for trees. So we're piloting things like creating protocols for plant, for watering to, to take place. Uh, but one of the cool things we, we just landed as part of these partnerships was collaboration between the nursery and, and um, a, tr uh, a school, for example, or a home. But the, the nursery has produced a, a sort of quality control form for the trees. If the saplings meet that quality, they, they will happily trade, you know, four or 500 um, uh, young saplings for 100 or 200 more mature saplings that are ready for transplanting. So this is kind of just a, a, an overview of, of how, the, how that tree life cycle is actually supported by multiple players uh, as the tree is germinated and comes to life. And a tree can take you know, two years or so to, to be ready to, to be put on the ground after germination. Um, so this is actually at the pilot site in Fort Myers. Uh, this is tree planting and, and care taking place. Uh, by our partner down there, Future Forestry with Russ Ringland. Um, a photo here shows that nursery site partner. Uh, we really don't want this to be technical and tree planting to be inaccessible. Uh, so this represents, uh, at least the nursery side of things, represents a little bit more of a, of a medium to large scale operation. We're trying to learn as much of this as possible to be able to make this kind of as easy as Pokemon Go, make tree planting or verifying as easy and, and fun as you know, going to collect a rare Pokemon in a park near you. Um, so by no means I, I, do, I, do we think that these protocols are limited to needing a nursery partner. In fact, there's a bit of a, of a call to action towards the end of this presentation. So we'll talk about next steps uh, uh, in case you wanna do some tree planting. Uh, so in, in Tampa, a bit closer in Tampa, so uh, I'm, in ba I'm based in, in, in Tampa and Fort Myers is just south of us, but here in the Tampa Bay area, we're in talks with a city uh, along with uh, the relationships we have with the school district uh, and with the county, because here in Florida, the school district is really a county. 
to bring all these government stakeholders together in a grand citizen science or citizen-led tree planting effort. So we'll have some more announcements uh, soon, but here we're zoning things like backyard land, private land, public land, you know, designated reforestation sites. A lot of it is more on the urban tree planting side of things because it's, it's uh, in the city. Um, but we're building protocols around citizen participation. Uh, they don't necessarily have participatory models, uh, but they do have budgets for tree care and tree planting. So uh, we're, we're co-developing this, this program to tap into these budgets and perhaps have some sort of economic innovation, economic development innovation to, to engage local citizens um, in, in, in tree care. Um, our big project, however, is in Africa. This is in Kenya. And this is uh, an effort to save the last remaining rainforest in Kenya, uh, Kakamega Forest. Um, our focus here maintains with schools, with uh, education stakeholders. Uh, it does have consultants and commercial operators, but our true goal here is to connect uh, about 100 schools surrounding this forest in its reforestation efforts, uh, which goes well beyond million tree plus opportunity. Um, so we're still in the first stage, uh, but these are real photos of existing uh, school partners. Uh, that's Eliud, uh, the uh, a representative who had already been working with, with schools in Kenya. And we're establishing nursery sites in the schools. We're looking to subsidize a lot of education work by providing uh, ultimately the, the, the budgets that, that are locked uh, in performance-based for the trees, but re released directly to the education school uh, stakeholders. So in a way, uh, climate action here is is helping to fund education and helping to uh, equip these communities with cell phones and um, tooling for blockchain and even payment systems are directly adopting things like stable coins and off ramping, um, uh, you know, directly into the community. So there's a lot of innovation happening here. We're super excited for, for this project and it will continue. Uh, to grow. Uh, if there are any partners uh, interested in, in, in discussing this more, uh, I would love to. We really want to broker this to the rest of the world, not just the carbon credits, but all types of organizations. One of the things we're doing just for context, uh, can't announce too much yet, but I'm waiting, I'm waiting on some developments there, is we're partnering with a, a clothing um, line that will represent tree plantings um, per, per for their apparel. So there will be different uh, collections of, of t-shirts uh, that represents tree plantings. There's a famous company called Tentry that does something very similar. Uh, the only difference is that we would have uh, QR codes within the, the shirts that show directly how the trees are doing and where they are um, and how, how they are traded on the secondary markets. Um, so our technology roadmap uh, here is is, is to, again, I saw a comment uh, alluding to the Pokemon Go thing. I, I do think that Pokemon Go is the perfect example or analogy of, of what we're doing. Uh, it already happened a few years ago, so it was very doable then, and it was involving co complex things like AR. Um, the reality is that everybody now basically has access to a phone, and there's a lot we can do uh, with phone technology and with internet to support um, uh, you know, tree planting uh, uh, and tree accountability and community building around the same. But our, our high tech uh, developments here are to build real time uh, inference uh, for things like volume of a tree, state of a tree, uh, trunk uh, you know, girth and thickness and diameters. Um, and so the, the goal here is to really be able to capture information about trees in real time um, to, be, to have that data compressible and interoperable with the rest of the Web3 space. Uh, this is a very recent vision-based scanning of a, of a rock on, on Reddit, um, but it does incorporate a lot of the technologies that we're looking to integrate for tree planting and tree scanning. Um, so, so yeah, it was Earth Month. We're, we've been very focused uh, in Florida and Tennessee on the distribution of of trees, there's actually a, a festival coming up in July called Fireflies in Tennessee. 
uh, reach out to me if you're interested in, in meeting some of the uh, conscious communities that were already present at Regenesis uh, in December um, um, and from Costa Rica and all over. We'll be planting a lot of trees in, in Tennessee. Um, ultimately, our trees uh, that are supporting some of our pilots are not all germinated uh, at home or, uh, uh, you know, in, in some of the ways that I'll show in the next slide, but there they are state registered nurseries that already support reforestation. So what we're doing is sourcing uh, these saplings, often quite affordable, um, and we're just adding uh, um, support systems to them uh, bef before being distributed and, and deployed within our pilot sites. For one, there we're incorporating things like QR codes and uh, stickers. These are tags, they, they are reusable. So it's not single use. Um, and the, there's also a biodegradable pot that we're including with, with the saplings. Those can go directly on the ground. Our goal is to make this obviously zero waste um, with the only current uh, uh, potential waste being the tags, but even them, even those are reusable. So after they retire, are, they don't, they are not retired after being used for a tree, they would be, they would go towards another tree. But these are unique QR code identifiers uh, as well as URL redirects so that for an existing steward using Sylvie, all they have to do is scan the QR code and they will be prompted to update that tree information within seconds. Um, and of course, if it's a new user, they would be prompted to sign up. Um, if they are unregistered QR codes, they would be prompted to be registered for an associated tree. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's a there's a lot we're doing with QR codes, and it's a lot of fun. And you know, we're, we're printing them just by the masses. I have them all over. So uh, a bit of a, a takeaway challenge uh, today. I will be sharing a little form for you in a second, uh, in case you're interested in trees or signing up with Sylvie whenever it comes out. Uh, but I, I did want to just encourage you to, to think about that one tree a year, at least a uh, 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 sort of task that you could adopt at home, you know, as under a light bulb, if that's all you have. Um, with just a little bit of, of soil or a recycled jar or something, it's, it's really very easy. Uh, during the Buckminster Fuller uh, Institute's program, uh, Vandana Shiva was invited to be a guest uh, speaker, and she talked about seed banks and how a lot of the the, the real change happening uh, with 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 seed bank and seed storage and sort of biodiversity conservation, mostly in the agriculture settings, but with a lot of potential for ecological settings as well, uh, comes from a very um, both uh, indigenous and smallholder farmer type of scale, uh, almost subsistence farmer. Though they are the ones truly caring for that seed diversity. So a year ago, I had no idea I would be excited to see, you know, a, a tree that has its pods ready uh, for for collection or even the nuances of mahogany. Um, but it's very doable. Uh, it's entertaining, highly entertaining, and I encourage you to. Think about finding trees that you'd like to propagate near you um, and not even worry about having to buy seeds online, but just finding what Mother Nature already has to offer near you. This is just a bit in an ascending order uh, of, of difficulty, sort of different germination techniques out there. Um, so we're all familiar with super simple you know, seed germination in, 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 in a paper towel, for example. Uh, you could do this uh, directly on soil. Uh, the paper towel just helps a little bit with the humidity and the stability, uh, but but it's not necessarily needed. Um, it is very useful for things like cold stratification. Cold stratification is is basically just the metabolic triggering of the of the seed um, that mimics what happens outdoors during cold seasons. So a lot of these seeds are dormant until they're activated and some many of those uh, require cold stratification. Um, there's other techniques. I, they, these certainly start um, bringing up some, some potential risks around diversity, but they involve cloning um, and um, clipping. Um, so we're not necessarily preserving um, emergence with cloning because we're, we're, 
we're, we're cloning, right? So we're not adding on to diversity here. But in many cases, it is it is the popular thing to do. Um, avocado seeds, for example, you know, you can't grow an avocado true to seed necessarily. So so if you germinate an avocado, while it is a super cool and fun plant or tree to, to germinate at home, um, you're not going to be producing the same a tree that would produce the same fruit. So it's it's in that case, it's not true to seed. And that's why, uh, you know, things like Haas avocados are, are, are genetically the same and they're grafted, for example. Uh, but, but, but yeah, don't be intimidated by some of these. It's pretty easy. Um, you could do it in a jar. You could, you know, even get a cloning agents that help with, with the rooting. Um, you do want to consider things like humidity levels. Uh, so after rooting, for example, you maybe want to cover, but basically uh, any tree out there would, would allow for some type of, of germination technique to take, to take place. I am working with mahogany, with pines, and with spruce. Um, I also have some acac acac acacias, uh, and, and it's all a, a lot of fun. So here's some photos of my setup um, um, using aquaponics to germinate, using trays. These are spruce. Uh, there are some tomatoes there in the middle of the pines. Don't, don't mind that. But this shows all types of different settings uh, uh, from grow tent, to just you know pot with soil this one lives in the in the balcony um this one is in an aquaponics system and you know it's a huge learning experience to see what does better where but it's it's also a lot of fun and there's some uh, mango seeds there drying up uh, and getting red for germination as well so with that um, i'm leaving this open we're going to start looking at some questions there on the right is a, a QR code to sign up for Sylvie. We'll be opening up, it up. Uh, we are focusing on, um, you know, bioregions uh, and, and also where we can subsidize some work. So if you're in Florida, for example, not only will we pr be providing QR codes to, to your trees and shipping them to you, uh, but we might even uh, be able to provide saplings. Uh, but if you're somewhere further out than Florida, uh, things become a little bit more remote. And we're talking to all types of partners to help build integrations and interoperability. Um, so it, 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 it's not going to be like a one-time pilot release. It's, it might happen over time, but we're so excited to connect with as many folks as possible around the world as the uh, tree uh, 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 protocols uh, expand and, and, and continue to be built around this methodolo methodology of of, of participating as a citizen in reforestation near you while leveraging things like a home or a school. Um, and then on the left here is my Twitter handle. I horrible on Twitter, but I've finally committed to it. So find me there if you can. And then that's Sylvie, Sylvie uh, also the, the Twitter handle. So let me just uh, see if there's any questions here so that I can answer them. Um, Jima, there was a couple um, connections that were made within the chat. Okay, let me check. Oh, I, I see here the history of, of um, capital refers to Latin uh, capitalis of the head. Uh, then maybe uh, space time is ripe to abolish capital and instead co-create co corporeal. That's cool. I also recently found out that securities uh, were originally like legally created uh, around like I think citric citric trees. So the idea that an investment could be made into a farm that grew trees that produced fruit that was then sold for money um, just you know turned that asset class into a security. So. Basically, uh, we, we, if, if only we could bring natural capital back into this world um, and still, you know, be able to have the SEC, for example, uh, respect nat natural capital's potential, that would be really cool. Let me see here. Any questions? Um, I see here NF trees spelled differently. I'm not sure what that is, but I'm copying that. There's also Avatry. We'll check that out as soon as possible. 
it's all just wordplay. Haven't heard of Tree Sisters. Thanks for putting that in. Yeah, curious if there are any more questions, if anybody wants to come up and, and ask direct questions. Maybe just come off mute because I can't actually see if there's hands being raised. Um, Go for I it. Would like, I would like to ask perhaps, is there already some experiences or anecdotes being shared of those who like, you know, grow up among those forests that they've planted? Because I think it's such beautiful mnemonic devices to have trees you know, growing around one and then be at home between them. And I'm just wondering how people, you know, w one thing is all the um, taking up data and pictures and all that. And I'm just wondering, how, do you have a, a an anecdote of one of those places where you feel rooted? For sure. So, I mean, what comes to mind is that uh, I, I, you know, I think the world has has certainly in increasingly um, respected and, and sought after sort of indigenous wisdom and uh, the know how uh, that 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 we might not find on Google, and that really depends on locality. Um, in Africa, there there a lot of forests and conservation projects have uh, participatory community models. And so Sylvie is, is in many cases leveraging those existing participatory models that often already pay attention at those things you're, you're describing. Um, there is a little bit of a, of a technology equipping and, and it might be, a, might be a very contrasting world uh, to equip uh, an indigenous community, for example, with blockchain and, and internet. Um, so, so that might be a conversation worth having. But uh, they are the, the technology's role, in my opinion, is to leverage as much as possible that know-how, that in, that indigenous wisdom, um, and and you know, often cases the the libraries of of of, of skill sets around medicinal uses and ecosystem services and uh, food services, etc. It'd be great to do storytelling on that, which is something we haven't necessarily started. Uh, uh, we will be doing an NFT drop, but it's much more of an ecological storytelling around uh, tree, uh, keystone tree species. Uh, but something that would be very cool is to work with artists uh, to talk about the role of communities in, in this as well. I love how you're weaving so many different technologies in here as well. And there's a lot of opportunity to get engaged just from a, a lay person's perspective, which is also very beautiful from the planting of trees. And then just if you haven't gone on uh, GMO's, I guess, form, it's not quite a website. Um, it offers the opportunity to, do you send people the seeds or how does that work? Right, so it depends on what bioregion you are, and if we will, to what extent we will support you, um, and hopefully over the long run we will we will be able to support anybody, uh, at least with with the with the the software uh, and the blockchain tools. Um, but yes, we're looking to to have some to to define some some you know some methodologies that can scale beyond our pilots uh, to to support school activities and home activities. Um, right now is very much a learning experience. And so often people have access to a, a, a farm or just a balcony or a backyard. And so we're looking to support you at least uh, informally in, in the time being um, and, and help you bring, you know, become a steward of at least a couple of trees. And that's the main goal. Beautiful. Is there anything else you wanted to add, Jimo? I just wanted to say thank you. This is a really beautiful project that just sprang up this last year out of a necessity um, necessity you saw. And I, I love that you're, you're really being innovative with what's needed in the world right now. I think that's incredibly beautiful and also timely. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Nico. Thanks, Faith. Thank you, Jimo. 
Indeed, Dima. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? How's the day going? What are you inspired by today? Does anybody want to, to unmute for a second and share uh, like three words or like a brief something that you've gotten inspired by today? Phenomenal, amazing, inspiring. Yes, Jarno, more of that. Did you catch that, Nico? I did. Anybody else that feels called to share? Oh, I suppose I can jump in. I've been listening to that whole presentation and for a good part of all of today's things. And yes, what an amazing uh, collection of people sharing some really uh, inspiring, innovative approaches. So thank you so much, and I'm so glad to be here and keep learning so many wonderful things. So good luck with that project. And yeah, thank you to Nico and Roxy and Bliss and everyone else for putting on such an incredible event to be part of. There is anybody to thank is the citizens of Virginia, the city and uh, their celebration. and. I'm going to spend some time um, now um, telling you a little bit about Regenera and, and its story. Um, so I'm going to share my screen uh, as we go through this. Uh, 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 give me one second. And let's put a little bit of a soundtrack here to have some background. Let me know if the music is too loud and I can lower it down a little bit. If there will be music, I can stop the stream. Uh, you think it might be copy written because the Thank laws you. of the internet get grumpy. The laws of the internet. Laws, what are those things? Can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah? Um, okay, cool. So, Nico. Yes? If you'll play music, I will stop it. So do you want to give me the screen for just a second and you can say, welcome the people on the stream to come on in so that we don't I can stop the music if you prefer. No, no, no. Absolutely. I think the music is good. I think we need music. Music is life. <laughs> okay, um, I'll stop the screen then. Just give because... me two seconds, and we mm -hmm. can uh, we can thank our our wild traversing travelers who are out there in the multiverse. Uh, let, me, let me find you because I lost you. I've lost you. I've lost oh, you, no. Jenner, and I oh. can't find you, and it's not nice. Oh no! I'm very. I am sad. lost. I'm lost on the internet. I don't like it. All right. All right. Tell, tell people where they are and that they should come and then I'll turn it off. People of the internet. We're going we're gonna to go to the vision train zoom. So if you're on the stream, get off the stream and find this one here. How do they find it? Well, they go to this bit.ly, bit.ly slash regenerate rising and they get a little ticket and they just scoot on in. Perfect. Come on over. It's going to be fun. I promise. The water's warm. 